The story begins with the protagonist who finds himself reincarnated in a fantasy world, a serene setting with flickering candles instead of modern lighting. Compared to Earth, this realm seemed less developed. However, for an orphan who had perished from overwork without a home, this seemed like a relatively affluent household to end up in. Additionally, another reason for considering it a wealthy family was the extraordinary beauty of the child's birth mother. His mother gazed at him with a loving look in her eyes, seemingly assuring a promising future in matters of love. Three years later, he caught his first glimpse of the outside world from his cradle, and it was truly otherworldly. Even as a young child, the vastness of the world beyond his window struck him profoundly, though his explorations were brief. Suddenly, the maid interrupted, calling out to the young master with concern. She swiftly picked him up from the window, cautioning about the dangers outside. It was then that he discovered his family's affiliation with the Grand Duchy, a prominent entity within the kingdom. He apologized to the maid. His identity is revealed as the son of the Grand Duke Dragonia in the Kingdom of Lionheart, essentially a duke by title. At the age of eight, he began training in swordsmanship, aspiring to become a knight in this fantastical realm. Would he also harness sword chi and aura in his training? His mentor was none other than Sir Gothic, a knight dispatched from the palace, known as the Holy Knight. Upon meeting him, Sir Gothic mused, sensing the will of the goddess in this encounter, finding it immensely rewarding to teach him. Introducing himself as Leon, he couldn't help but wonder about this title of Holy Knight. Polite and eager, he requested Sir Gothic to take good care of him and inquired about the unfamiliar term. His training was hard, he was asked to drag a big rock tied with a rope. Fully drenched in sweat, in an abrupt outburst, he exclaimed in frustration about the challenging nature of dealing with the imposing figure of Sir Gothic. It felt like a form of mistreatment for a child. Over fourteen years, he discovered that a holy knight was more akin to a monstrous entity cloaked in human guise, and attaining such a position was an incredibly arduous feat Gothic asks him to take one more lap and tells him that the path to becoming one involves completing quests through rigorous training, earning the title of a kingdom knight through experience and valor being chosen by the Holy Grail, and partaking in a ritual of drinking holy water. Additionally, as the son of Dragonia, there was the added responsibility of mastering the knowledge required to become a Grand Duke. Amidst all this, Gothic's advice emphasized the importance of unwavering focus on opponents and the lessons necessary not just to become a holy knight but also to prepare as a successor to the Grand Duke. Leon contemplated the existence of a deity expressing a desire for salvation if such a higher power truly existed, despite not subscribing to any particular religious beliefs. For sixteen years, he wandered the world, seeking recognition from the goddess to become a holy knight by accepting his quest. How does one gain the acknowledgement of the goddess? In a painful cry, he lamented the overwhelming swarm of challenges. The belief was that accumulating fame and performing good deeds would eventually attract her attention, an idea that he found absurd. Amidst the chaos, a concerned voice asks a guard named Sir Gildas about the influx of orcs, questioning if it might be the end and pleading for the goddess's protection. However, despite the overwhelming situations, there were countless opportunities for him to wield his sword, which left him feeling anxious. Leon grimly questions the audacity of invading the kingdom's territory with soiled feet. He strikes the monster with his sword, highlighting the numerous enemies the kingdom faced for over twenty years. Finally meeting the goddess, she acknowledged Leon as the son of Wolfric Dragonia, confirming the truth in their words. Calmly, she presented a quest to test his honor and faith, to which Leon humbly bowed and accepted, addressing her as Ariana. The existence of the goddess was confirmed. After toiling for years, he ascended to become a holy knight. His path led to battles, where he faced orcs, tore apart goblins, and fought against an evil cult. His valor elevated him to the position of a war knight granting him authority to lead other knights. He engaged in a conflict that resulted in the demise of 700,000 orcs, regardless of gender or age, women and children, which left him feeling revitalized, yet somewhat remorseful for the carnage caused. After 35 years, the revered figure, Arjun Majesty Leonhard, known as the Living Saint and Demigod, met his demise while Leon was battling the archdemon summoned by the Empire. The uprising of demons added to the already challenging presence of orcs, amplifying the chaos. This violent situation emphasized the necessity for humanity to embrace faith in gods and live devotedly. 
Despite the aggravation caused by the Empire's magicians, a pressing need emerged to elect a new holy knight, one to succeed King Leonhardt, who had died honorably. Amidst this turmoil, the goddess addressed Leon Dragonia, acknowledging him as her faithful knight and symbol of honor and faith, selecting him to ascend as the successor amid her descent upon them. He humbly bowed before the goddess, accepting the weighty responsibility that came with the position of honor and exhaustion. His commitment was unwavering as he couldn't afford to disappoint the kingdom's citizens and the knights who followed him. Transferring the sacred treasure, the lion heart, from the goddess, he pledged to safeguard the holy grail. Thus, he ascended to become the Grand Duke of Dragonia and the King of the Lionheart Kingdom. Over eighty years, numerous significant events unfolded, a trilogy of major wars against orcs, the evolution of a peculiar hunchback goblin into an archdemon, and the Empire consistently creating chaotic situations. A guard alerted Leon, addressing him as, Your Majesty, about the Empire's dark magicians resuming experimentation, defying divine authority. Outraged, Leon condemned their actions, considering them foolish divine separatists attempting to defy the divine order. Leon commanded the gathering of the knights, fueled by the belief that extending human rights to those unworthy is a grave mistake, considering the idea of conquering them all. After ninety-six years, the empire had finally crossed the pivotal line. An orc, with aggression in its tone, offered three million live offerings, desperately pleading for their request to be granted. The emperor, who once claimed fear of death, tragically ended his life along with three million citizens from the capital, summoning the Lord of Chaos. Eventually, Leon rallied the knights, unsheathing a holy sword still marked with the grease from the previous year's orc encounters. He commanded his guards, urging them to move toward the empire. In the year 121, they set forth toward the empire. Despite his earnest efforts, the world was crumbling, contrary to his deepest desires. He endeavored to conquer all darkness with the purity that resonated across this land, yet he couldn't halt their advance. One of his guards addressed him as Lord Leon, to which he responded, acknowledging Sir Arryn and honoring his father's honorable demise, as he joined the god's feast. Reflecting on the goddess, Leon rallied all troops, urging them to observe the scene before them. He noted the trembling fear in their comrades, the haunting sound of villains echoing across the land, and the heart-wrenching sight of women consoling their weeping children, silently enduring their own grief. The same individuals, who had stolen away their brothers. Leon shouted, enraged, Do you hear the anguish of our brothers, the young ones grasping onto the fading flames of resistance in their hands? Can you sense the villains who have torn away our loved ones? And observe the knights striving to sow seeds of hope in a land drenched in blood. He further questions, Do you perceive the threats attempting to desecrate everything? He tells them to be enraged internally, and call out against the fools deceived by false victory. He addresses the goddess, possessing the holy sword, the holy spear, and the holy grail, declares that even the first knight wouldn't be able to halt the evil that had spread far beyond the horizon. Stressing the significance of honor, he reiterated that as long as they held on to it, they wouldn't falter. Seeking guidance, Leon appealed to the goddess questioning what this foolish knight should do for her. In response, the goddess assured him of her unwavering presence, declaring her commitment to remain by his side until the very end, addressing him as her beloved honored knight. In a resounding cry for Lionheart, all troops charged into battle. That winter marked the culmination, where they engaged in the ultimate conflict against billions of devils swarming the earth. Barbarian slaves were ruthlessly used as human shields while civilian knights armed with spears, and shields valiantly met their honorable demise, alongside the glorious knights. As the chosen agent representing all gods and holy temples, he stood alone, confronting and vanquishing the demons until the very end. Countless demon lords and archimans fell to his hand, demonstrating the might of the holy knight against those vile adversaries. Two hundred and seventeen years had passed, yet the unending winter persisted. At two thirty-one, two hundred and thirty-four, and two hundred and fifty-six years into the battle, he destroyed the last remaining demon gate, leaving them with nowhere to escape. Furiously shouting at these servants of evil, he condemned them to remain trapped in this world with him, vowing to exterminate every last one. It wasn't him who was stuck, it was those vow being stuck in this realm with him. Despite this, three hundred years have passed, and Leon landed a final strike on the archdemon. A blue portal appeared and a voice asked Hari if she was alright, witnessing a man defeat the archdemon with a single strike. Leon came out of the portal and remarked, Rise and continue fighting, acknowledging that now wasn't the time to falter. When Hari inquired about Leon's identity, 
standing naked in a yellow glowing aura, he replied in a deep, resonant voice stating that he is the King Lionheart, the Knight of the Glorious Knights, and the executor of the Holy Temple's will, Leon Dragonia Lionheart. It shocked the girl named Hari and her fellow. It was three centuries since he encountered the Earthlings, marking the return of the Night King. A notification screen pops up, stating that he has defeated all the demons. In Seoul, a mysterious gate emerged, its rank shrouded in an unidentifiable black hue. Both the Korean Hunter Association and the World Hunter Association urged the nation's major guilds to join a raid, but their requests were declined due to the gate's unknown difficulty. Ultimately, the government mandated the Korean Hunter Association to venture in first, essentially issuing an execution order. Hari recalls that inside, what greeted her was a sight, a solitary naked man. Han Hari is an associate manager at the Korean Hunter Association. His fellow calls to her who is immersed in this thought, he expresses concern while handing her the coffee, acknowledging her exhaustion. Hari replied wearily, thanking him. Kim Jin Su, the head manager of the Korean Hunter Association, inquires about the situation. She responds, stating that no one believed it. Jin Su remarks that such skepticism was anticipated, considering it was a black rank demon gate housing even the great devil. He acknowledged the miraculous feat of returning alive without aid from other guilds, let alone clearing it, a feat attributed to one man. We see Leon being questioned if he is a survivor, from inside the gate, to which he confirms, identifying himself as a survivor from the other world, confusing Hari, and Jin Su listening from the other side of the glass window. There have been sporadic instances of individuals surviving within the gate realm. These gates, appearing worldwide over the past three decades, share commonalities. They depict worlds on the brink of destruction or already destroyed. At times, survivors return to Earth, retaining unbelievable strength acquired in the demon realm. Consequently, the government made efforts to support these survivors and devised plans to scout them. Hari stressed the urgency of scouting these survivors, emphasizing the unparalleled strength of a specific individual. Jinsu seems to share the sentiment, doesn't he? He states, no matter the circumstance. Even an A-rank hunter has to risk their life when facing a high-ranking demon. Yet, he managed to eliminate the great devil with just one attack, a feat that even the most skilled S-rank hunters fear. It wasn't just a kill, he utterly dominated it. Jin Su contemplates his primary concern being the potential cultural differences, evident in how this individual refers to himself. It hints at royalty or something of the sort. Hari chimes in, expressing optimism, to which he questions her reasoning. Hari believes she can sense something positive in his voice a notion that he's a genuinely good person. Suddenly, Leon's voice booms, addressing the person in front of him as a lowly being. Hari and Jinsu are startled by his behavior. Leon continued, the barrier that even monsters couldn't breach. He angrily bellowed, expressing his outrage at anyone tarnishing the notable Lionheart name. The manager, taken aback, questioned the notion of this individual being a very good person. Hari cautiously attributed it to potential cultural differences. Fifteen minutes earlier, Leon reflected on feeling foreign in certain aspects, a given considering his background. He was an orphan who toiled through his twenties, meeting his end due to exhaustion. Then, he reincarnated into another world, reigning as king and knight of a kingdom for over a century. After subjugating the demon world, he spent two hundred years hunting demons, toiling three hundred years, a relief to retain some memories of this place. A bald man approached Leon, addressing him as Leon Dragonia. Lionheart Nim. Leon pondered the situation, recognizing that revealing his past as an earthling wouldn't serve his interests. He contemplated whether a knight king who lived three hundred years in the other world was more favorable than a man in his twenties who died from overworking. Furious, he demanded the man refer to him as your majesty, calling him a peasant, leaving the man shocked and hesitantly complying. Leon observed that the man was playing along and pondered whether he was simply a kind-hearted individual or if the government was cautious in approaching survivors like himself. The man cautiously asked Leon about the Black Gate, or rather, his world, and the encounters with their hunters, inquiring about the demon's slayings. Upon Leon's silence, the man pressed further, asking if he had forgotten something. Hesitantly, the man sought clarification, unaware of the context. Leon proudly declared his role in eliminating the evil species, protecting knightly honor, and then unexpectedly appointed the man as his temporary secretary granting him the privilege of documenting the momentous event. The man, taken aback, speculated that it might be a cultural difference. Leon, still discontent, 
demanded proper etiquette when addressing royalty. He used the translated phrase to express his hunger, which the bald man urgently acknowledged, swiftly promising to arrange a meal. Leon, seeking information about the current world, requested details about Earth during his absence. The man murmured in affirmation, agreeing to provide him an explanation. He tells Leon, the nightmare commenced thirty years ago when Gates began appearing worldwide, unleashing monsters and demons. Since then, they've been in a constant state of emergency, facing significant losses. We learn that each gate carries a distinct theme and a clear quest. Leaving a gate unattended triggers a dungeon break, leading to monster invasions on Earth. The man informed Leon that the meal might be ready as they heard a knock at the room's door. Leon reflected on the differences, noting that in his world, demons appeared en masse, unlike these gates with specific themes and quests, as if designed to train humans through trials. The bald man enthusiastically enters the room with the food for his majesty. Inspecting the food, Leon recognized it as bone broth simmered for hours, seasoned with salt, pepper, and crunchy kimchi. Salongtang, similar to soul food, held sentimental value for him from his laborer days on earth. Familiar foods tend to be more enjoyable compared to new ones, yet Leon struggled to swallow down the unfamiliar saliva accumulating in his mouth. Puzzled, he questioned the nature of the dish. The man clarified, calling it salongtang, known as the soul food of peasants to his surprise. He angrily shouted, feeling insulted that they dared to stain the revered Leonhart name. Outraged, he questions the treatment of a royal from another kingdom, expressing his disbelief at being served what he considered a peasant's dish. In his frustration, he proclaims his titles as the royal from the other world, asserting his role as the proxy for the gods, the guardian of the holy grail, and the possessor of the holy blade and holy spear. The man murmured, seemingly not understanding the situation. In response, Leon shouted grimly, demanding the inferior peasant to leave. He then elaborates on his various titles, such as Malice, the Lord of Chaos, and the adversary of the Twenty-Three Great Devils, an embodiment of the Three Hundred Year War's history. Furthermore, he ponders that he's a returner, having once been an earthling. Upon his return to Earth after three centuries, his immediate observation is the chaotic state of affairs. He attributes this disorder to the lack of proper religious faith, and believes that enlightening the foolish peasants is the duty of the royal family. Despite being back on earth, he retained his identity as a night king. Later, we see him eating steak. Jinsu seems surprised by the recognition of their chicken and black bean noodles. He encourages Hari, who looks flustered to take the lead, suggesting that Leon might be more intrigued by her. She was complimented on her bravery and Jinsu mentions that at least she won't be dismissed. Hari expresses her frustration noting that all Leon had acknowledged was her bravery. Peeking in from the door, she apologized deeply for the interruption while Majesty was eating. In response, Leon, wiping his lips, recognizes her as the swordsman from earlier and invites her to sit down. She is pleased to receive positive attention for sitting with the king. With a hint of hesitance, she inquires about the meal's quality. He calmly responds, acknowledging the sincerity and finesse of the chef. He clarifies that the issue wasn't the simplicity of the food but rather the attitude displayed toward the king. He adds assertively, emphasizing that foreign royalty should be treated with due respect, linked to the status of one's nation. Expressing regret for her lack of knowledge and any disrespect shown, she felt apologetic. Leon assured her it was fine and redirected the conversation, asking if her name was Han Hari. He then expressed awareness of the world. He asked her, demons, those malevolent beings, have appeared on earth, correct? Hari confirms the statement. Her sole mission was to persuade him to join the Hunter Association. She's contemplating, realizing the importance of at least getting him to join their cause. She then asks the king if, perhaps, he would grant permission for the South Korean government to take care of him from that point onward. The 21st century intelligence war aims to recruit survivors, but it's crucial to prevent them from joining other nations despite promised support. Leon asserts that as long as he's established in this world, it's his duty to take to the battlefield. He believes that as an honorable knight, it's only proper for him to engage in combat. She eagerly asks him if he'd consider joining their hunter's association. He responds with a glint in his eyes, that a king cannot serve in another nation's military. Instead, he intends to establish a new knight's order in this world. Hari is shocked but can only nod in response. Curious about the reaction from higher authorities, she asks Jin Su. He explains that there isn't much to say except that they need to offer as much support as possible, relieved that Leon hasn't aligned with another country, 
or major guilt. In a weary tone, she expresses her frustration at the idea of their association, linked to the government, having to show deference to Leon. She expresses anger at the situation, attributing it to the influential and wealthy guilds that wield power and influence. The manager responds in agreement, acknowledging the influence of the Phoenix Guild in the matter. Their conversation is abruptly interrupted by an urgent alert signal, indicating a dungeon break at the Honam Plains. Jinsu expresses shock at the potential ramifications of a dungeon break occurring at a granary location, highlighting the dire consequence it could pose to food production. Meanwhile, Hari reflects on the Phoenix Guild's association with the renowned S-rank hunter, Lee young wan pondering whether his capabilities could prevent an orange-colored gate from wreaking havoc. Jin Su's anger flares as he firmly believes that these guilds might have ulterior motives, demanding immediate action to prevent their schemes from unfolding. Amid their discussion, unbeknownst to them, Leon listens attentively to everything said behind the closed door, gaining a comprehensive understanding of the situation. He contemplates the implications of a potential dungeon break, recognizing the potential devastation it could cause to the land, infecting the ground and hampering crop growth. Observing the situation, he questions Demera, a soldier, about their well-being in light of the looming crisis. Meanwhile, a soldier calls out to Hunter yong seeking answers amidst the chaos. Li yong an S-rank hunter and the guild master of the Phoenix Guild, stands amidst the tumult, inquiring if the person addressing him is from the association, seeking to understand the unfolding events. He mockingly addresses Section Chief Kim and mocks the presence of rookie Han Hari. Meanwhile, Jin Su sees with anger, believing that Yong Wan purposefully orchestrated the dungeon break as retaliation for their refusal to accept his guild's requests. The Phoenix Guild had persistently sought tax exemption for their substantial gains from gate-related profits, including magical crystals and materials from monsters. Their request amounted to a staggering tax exemption of one trillion, a move seen as an act of vengeance for their unmet demands. Jin Su sees with anger, frustrated by the excessive privileges the large guilds already enjoy. He finds it outrageous that the Phoenix Guild would resort to such extreme measures simply because their requests were turned down. Meanwhile, Hari addresses Hunter Yongwan sternly, emphasizing the urgency of closing the gate immediately. She stresses the critical time frame of one week, highlighting the potential risks if the gate remains open for too long. He responds calmly but with a smile, acknowledging the situation's severity and the imminent transfer of gate authority. He expresses concern about the critical condition of their guild members, noting the challenges they face in executing a raid with such serious injuries. Despite aiming to attempt the closure by the next day, he remains unsure of the outcome given their circumstances. Hari confronts Yongwan with grim seriousness, questioning his lack of patriotism and emphasizing the dire consequences if the Honam Plains were to be infected. In a seemingly casual manner, he dismisses her concerns, jokingly remarking on her perceived childishness, and reminding her of a discussion they had in the past. He cynically highlights the prevalent notion in this world that justice equates to money and power. Observing this exchange, Leon contemplates silently on their shallow and old-fashioned perspectives. Hari, taken aback by Leon's sudden appearance, addresses him hesitantly, seeking confirmation of his identity, as she refers to him respectfully as Your Majesty. Leon adopts a serious demeanor and advises Hari against using a king's name so casually, asserting that he permits her to address him only by his title. However, Yongwan carelessly asks Leon about his identity, commenting on his western appearance. This provokes an intense reaction from Leon, who silences Yongwan with a fierce expression and questions his audacity to speak. This infuriates Yongwan, who shouts angrily, taking offense at being called lowly by Leon. Meanwhile, Hari intervenes, addressing him as Hunter Lee Yongwan to defuse the tension. Yongwan, learning that Leon is a survivor, apologizes for his earlier rudeness and introduces himself as part of the Phoenix Guild. Curiously, he questions whether Leon is associated with the Grey-Colored Guild. In response, Leon adopts a serious tone, asserting a king's reluctance to repeat himself. He then turns to Jin Su and asks for a concise summary of the situation, as he lacks specific details about the gate. Meanwhile, the managers seem hopeful, wondering if Leon intends to offer his assistance. Hari clarifies the situation, emphasizing the gravity of a dungeon break. During such an event, a significant amount of demonic energy spills out, infecting the land and rendering it infertile for crops. The Honam Plains, a vital granary, faces critical jeopardy due to this. Leon, seeking a solution, inquires further. 
In response, she proposes the urgent need to purify the infected area swiftly, aiming to clear the dungeon entirely to prevent further contamination and restore normalcy to the affected land. Leon comprehends the gravity of the situation, acknowledging that the infected land and the gate's expansion pose a significant problem. He instructs Hari to assemble their forces and assures that as soon as the time limit for dealing with the initial raid expires, he, as the king, will take direct action. However, he adds that as a foreign king, he cannot unilaterally engage in military activities in another nation's territory without adhering to regulations. Initially, he insists that before taking any action, he must first secure permission from the local king. When Hari expresses hesitation, he emphasizes the importance of adhering to the proper procedures and regulations, questioning how someone can claim to be an honorable knight if they disregard the laws of their own nation. He urges her to promptly communicate with their king, stressing the necessity of following protocol and seeking authorization. Yongwan muses that the individual in question is even worse than himself. Eventually, there was a request made. Hari, following Leon's directive, prepared certain items, yet she questions how these preparations will be utilized. Leon clarifies the necessity of purifying the infected land, to which Hari hesitantly questions the efficacy of using a straw doll for this purpose. He made two specific requests, one of which involved the straw doll. He inquires Hari if the dolls were crafted by the wives. Hari nods in agreement. The other directive was that the creators of the dolls should be women who had given birth. Leon then requested everyone to present the dolls they had made. This led to an unexpected doll-making competition right in the middle of the plains. A woman fails to meet the requirements. Displeased, Leon comments on the dolls, criticizing them as metaphysical eccentricities and deems them disgraceful, declaring them as failures. He angrily questions why they claim to have given birth when they are not, and calls them foolish and dense. Hari fails her task to provide a doll after he rejects several of them. Everything fails except for one woman who was standing there, the 89th participant, an elderly married woman who caught Leon's attention with her creation. He questions her about the number of children she had given birth, to which she replies she had given birth to twelve. He marveled at her as the epitome of a living patriot. Leon expressed his usual gesture of appreciation, mentioning that he usually sends knights with medals and gifts personally. However, due to the ongoing situation, he couldn't do so, and instead, he held the woman's hand. He told her normally he personally sends a knight and gift, but he could not do to the gravity of the situation, acknowledging that the conditions had been fulfilled. He materializes a large cup from a blue portal made with his hand and begins chanting, invoking the spirit of the earth. Mother of this bountiful land, we offer you this doll of harvest, please accept it. A golden light emanates from the cup, leaving everyone stunned. Hari exclaims in amazement, the cup is filled with water by itself. He further recites the chanting, the sun is rising, casting a crimson hue on the clouds. It's the dawn of a new day, but this sunrise will mark a special beginning for our world. Yongwan shouts, alarmed, the water droplets are going inside the doll? Just now the doll stood on its own. Meanwhile, Leon, scrutinizing the ground, declares, I offer my greetings to Mother Earth, to Demera, the god of life and abundance. It's been a while since divinity has descended upon this land. He continues reciting chants. Salutations to the mighty Earth Mother, and greetings to you, Demera, the divine being presiding over life and fertility. This new territory is now plagued by malevolence, with the land tainted and corrupt. There are indeed evil beings here, but alas, no trace of divinity. I fear the disrespect may tarnish your sanctity while giving a side eye to the guild master. He voices his concern. Demera responds with a deep voice, Ignorance and greed are not always considered sins. They are inherent traits of mortals. What do you intend to do now? Leon replies, It's relatively simple to assimilate among the swordsmen, but the power wielded by a conqueror holds divine authority. He aims to establish a balance where duty and authority stand shoulder to shoulder. He intends to enlighten the uninformed and guide them toward the correct path. Until a new pantheon emerges in this realm. Demira responds, Child, do you seek a favor from me? I am always ready to assist. Leon respectfully addresses her. Dear Demira, the free people of this earth suffer from malevolent energy. I understand it's not your wish, but please heal and purify this land. Demira acknowledges him as her temple's champion. While the doll drips a droplet of water, it remarks, This world's soil isn't my body, but I shall imbue it with my divinity, replacing this arid earth with my essence. Then, all that walks upon this land shall be your ally. 
a yellow light emerges from the land and Leon states, Those of you lacking knowledge and understanding, pay attention. This is a realm endowed with divine blessings. Flourish and thrive, for it is the righteous duty of every living being. The crops start to look flourished and full of crops. Young One's voice booms, urging everyone to be cautious. He warns about magically cultivated crops being harmful, insisting it's common knowledge. Meanwhile, Leon expressed disdain for his ignorance, defending the crops as divinely blessed and rebuking Young One's labeling of them as poison. Leon's warning to him underscores the need to refrain from defiling the goddess with careless words. Young Wan, agitated, voices frustration as his plan appears jeopardized. He's determined not to let it fail and vows to reveal what he perceives as lies. Despite this, he urges cooperation for the people's safety and promises to take steps to expose what he believes to be fraudulent, offering an appraiser to authenticate the situation. One of Yong Wan's companions steps up, initiating the process by drawing a magical circle on the crops, resulting in the emergence of a window displaying information. The rice's rank is labeled as rare, possessing divine blessings from Demira, the goddess of life and fertility. The surprising revelation that this rice can cure to three diseases, even cancer, shocks everyone present, including Hari and Jitsu. After this discovery, Yongwan directs someone to fetch a pot from the chief's house. The rice is cooked, and upon tasting it, they observe a significant increase in benefits. Stamina recovery rate of 100 each minute, a mana recovery rate of 50 each minute, with a total duration of 8 hours. Essentially, it functions as a powerful enhancer. Jinsu is perplexed, questioning how simple rice could possess the same potency as a 3 million won bottle of reinforcement. Hari couldn't contain her excitement, urgently calling the manager to share the breakthrough. The manager advised her to finish chewing first before speaking, to which she admitted being curious and inadvertently consuming a bug. This revelation shocks him, as another soldier also experiences a beneficial effect from consuming a bug. This occurrence made them wonder if this blessing extended across the entire land. Jinsu contemplated the possibility of a free reinforcer benefiting all living beings. Excitedly, they ventured into the crops, catching bugs and encouraging one another to gather as many as possible to enter the gate fully buffed. This discovery significantly boosted the motivation of the Hunter Association's raiding team. Demera addresses Leon with a familiar tone, calling him child. He respectfully acknowledges her as the goddess Demera. She expresses a sense of completion in her role here and states her intent to leave. Leon replies, expressing his gratitude and deep remembrance of the divine love she bestowed upon them. Demera then requests permission to impart one final lesson before vanishing. Hari intrigued, starts to question Leon, but he swiftly explains the concept of divine power. Hari continues her inquiry about the existence of a god in this world, to which Leon admits uncertainty. He emphasizes that a world sustained by divine power forms the foundation of a proper life. Leon directs their attention to the soldiers, indicating their readiness to enter the gate now that they are fully prepared. Yong Wan's comrade expresses concern, addressing him as the guild master, worried about potential issues arising from their current situation. Yong Wan, visibly upset, vents his frustration about survivor Leon's interference, blaming the predicament on this individual. He expresses a strong desire for him to perish inside the gate, contemplating it as a potential solution. His comrade, taken aback, inadvertently utters Yong Wan's name, but he reassures his companion not to fret, mentioning that this gate has already been partially raided. The soldier reflects on the challenging nature of the middle section of the gate's interior, but notes, there's only one A-rank hunter inside, Han Hari. Despite acknowledging Hari as a survivor with a supportive role rather than combat prowess, the soldier expresses confidence in their group's ability to handle the situation, indicating they believe the survivor's presence won't significantly affect the outcome of their mission. Within the gate, a formidable monster emerges, proving resistant to conventional methods of defeat. Suddenly, an urgent warning alert flashes, announcing the commencement of a dungeon break. The dire message announces the imminent peril, putting all life forms inside the gate on a ticking countdown to potential demise. As they enter the portal, they arrive in the dungeon. Their group proceeds cautiously. Jinsu leads the way with a shield, Leon stands behind him in the middle, and Hari is positioned slightly ahead. Leon understands that most portals close after the completion of the task or by defeating the boss inside. He relishes the idea of facing a boss. Hari being anxious was unable to tell him that it usually requires a team battle, as bosses tend to gang up on them. As they observe the skeleton strewn across the ground, Leon mentions that he's aware of this, 
having been told that they attempted dungeon clearances previously, but there seemed to be more monsters than he expected. Hari responds, explaining that it's a characteristic of this particular dungeon. He is taken aback by the term characteristic. She explains to him that while the number of monsters decreases as you defeat them in most gates, in the case of skeletons, zombies, or even special demons in specific instances, as long as the boss monster is alive, they'll infinitely respawn. He finds it interesting and finally grasps that the cycle only ends if the boss is defeated. He remarks that this must be one of those boss dungeons, to which she agrees, suggesting it must be a necromancer controlling the skeletons. Suddenly, she sees a warning message flash across the screen, signaling the start of a dungeon break. Reading the red alert, which states that death has been sentenced, and posing a three-hour time limit on all living beings within the gate. The boss monster, Commander Knight Dullahan, will gather its troops, and they must defeat the commander within three hours. Frozen in place, everyone feels the weight of the impending challenge. Jinsu shouts, cursing Yongwan for not warning them about such an obstacle in advance. Hari appears somewhat nervous, but in contrast, Leon remains unfazed. Their attention is drawn to a hand gripping a knight's helmet, its eyes emitting a haunting blue glow on a rocky perch. As the horse raises on its back legs thousands of skeletons loom before the rock. Another window appears, displaying a countdown of two hours and fifty-eight minutes to defeat the knight on the horse. As the skeletons prepare to launch their assault, they cast a shadow of doubt, lowering the group's morale. Amidst the looming threat, the group starts discussing the overwhelming number of skeletons. One of them turns to the manager, inquiring about the distribution of potions. Seeking to boost their spirits, he attempts to rally the group, emphasizing the crucial need for concentration, especially in allocating the potions to the upper ranks. He directs an individual named Mashik to check the current count of archers and mages present. Mashik, a skilled woman armed with a bow, activates a skill allowing her to discern two enemy mages and thirty archers. Expertly commanding the group, Chief Kim directs snipers to eliminate long-range fighters and instructs others with shields to block the advancing skeletons, thousands of skeletons close in, launching their relentless attacks. Jinsu shouts, wishing the skeletons good luck in facing them, skillfully blocking their initial strikes. He realizes their strength surpasses expectations, unyielding in their assault. He wonders if they are stronger than he thought but concludes that the orange gates are a whole different level but still manageable for a B-ranked tank like himself. He counters with swift and precise movements, shattering the skeletons with the prowess of a B-ranked tank. Amidst the skirmish, he notices two mages casting spells behind him. He ponders at the advanced skills possessed by mere skeletons. Determined to divert their attention, he shouts loudly, directing the group's focus toward the mages through the cave. Magical projectiles fly toward him, causing concern among his comrades but he manages to withstand the onslaught. Calming his comrades, he reassures them, saying it was just a minor sting and that he's fine, adding a note about the expensive nature of his gear. The headless knight stands before him, emanating an aura of menace. Unfazed, Jinsu locks eyes with the formidable foe. Clad in black armor and surrounded by a blue aura, the knight strikes at him. Though he barely manages to block the invasion, he is forcefully thrown back, landing amidst a pile of rocks. Hari is gripped with worry as she witnesses Chief Kim's plight, eager to assist him. Another girl turns to Hari, seeking guidance on the next move, emphasizing the need to save the chief. They ask if they should call upon the reserve forces for help. Hari ponders that this is precisely what the reserve forces are for, they must aid Jinsu now. Meanwhile, he shouts to his forces about how the monster boss wields the great sword too easily, urging them to stop it. Hari further considers that even though Leon is the king of the Lionheart who defeated a demon king, with no time to wait for reinforcements, they urgently need a solution. Approaching Leon, she pleads for his assistance. However, he remains calm, stating that a king doesn't intervene in insignificant small battles. Perplexed, Hari struggles to comprehend his response. Leon's words suggest that they must find ways to build their own honor. He expresses disbelief that Hari would try to force him to help take on those damn bones, deeming it rude to the goddess and asserting that he can't bear to watch it anymore. Hari is frustrated by Leon's apparent indifference, and the group turns to her seeking direction on what to do next. While she doesn't fully grasp Leon's message, she realizes that there's no time for that as he has no intention of helping. She thinks he seems to have no interest in anything except Dullahan. Meanwhile, Leon ponders how the undead moves like that. With time running out, 
Hari's focus shifts solely to the headless knight. Unsheathing her sword, she makes up her mind to defeat the boss. Encouraging the rest of the group to support Chief Kim and their allies, she fearlessly charges forward, cutting through the ranks of skeletons. Using a skeleton's head as a springboard, she propels herself higher, matching the level of the headless knight. She unleashes a powerful strike aiming for the knight, but he skillfully parries her attack with his great sword. Despite her disappointment, Hari understands the importance of separating him from the group. To her surprise, she notices the knight has discarded his head and is preparing a devastating attack with his fist. Bracing herself, she thinks that the knight did it to block her view. She wonders what kind of undead fights like this. She's attempting to block the assault, but the impact sends her flying backward. With unwavering determination, she swiftly regains her composure, only to find the headless knight standing before her once more, having partially achieved her goal of separating from the rest. She apologizes to her comrades, acknowledging that her range of skills was insufficient. Suddenly, a colossal explosion engulfs everything in sight, yet the knight effortlessly blocks it, displaying unyielding resilience. Hari launches another raid, driven to conclude the battle. Meanwhile, the knight continues to block each strike seemingly unharmed. Observing the knight's blade blocking the Blonover attack, Hari notices the stance the knight takes as it swings its blade towards him. As she closes her attacks just as the strike reaches her, a voice interrupts the fight, shouting in admiration. Leon steps forward, applauding, expressing regret to the headless knight for underestimating it as a mere undead creature. Extending a noble gesture, Leon offers the knight the chance to engage in an honorable duel. Walking towards Hari and the Death Knight, he insists that there's no need for further casualties among their troops. Let this conflict conclude with a noble duel between two warriors. With pride in his voice, Leon shouts his proposition, leaving Hari, Jinsu, and even a skeleton among them in utter disbelief, their expressions filled with astonishment. Initially silent, the headless adversary eventually embraces the challenge. The skeletons lurking in the cave suddenly become intrigued by the captivating showdown between Leon and the knight. Approaching slowly, their hollow eye sockets fixate on the unfolding duel with the utmost attention. Leon stands confidently before the monstrous boss, displaying a mix of arrogance and respect as he summons his sword, its gleaming blade catching the faint light. He commands the headless knight to remove his helmet, but the knight remains silent, his intentions concealed behind the armor. With unwavering determination, Leon asserts that he's certain the knight fights with a two-handed sword, placing him at a disadvantage. Enveloping his sword with a vibrant yellow aura, a manifestation of his skill and power sensing an imminent clash approached Leon and informed him that the headless knight would not be defeated unless he was decapitated. Unfazed, Leon asks if this detail is crucial to their victory. He is frozen in astonishment at this revelation. Hari affirms that it is indeed crucial. She ponders how Leon intends to emerge victorious if he can't execute the decisive blow. Realizing the gravity of their conversation, the knight hands its head to one of the serving skeletons. Taking a moment to explain his perspective to Hari, Leon emphasizes that the duel's outcome hinges on the knight's sense of honor. As he and the headless knight assume their respective starting positions, their focus remains unwavering. Speaking his name aloud, Leon proclaims himself as the first knight of the goddess of light and justice. Dragonia's Archduke, and the Lion-Hearted King. He then sanctions this honorable duel with the knight. Expecting a reciprocal introduction from the knight, Leon is met with silence. As soon as Leon announces the beginning of the duel and finishes uttering his own name, the enemy grips its sword with certainty and charges forward, unleashing a powerful attack. However, to Leon's nonchalant surprise, he effortlessly blocks the strike, his skills far surpassing those of the knight. Observing the knight's movements with kingly attention, Leon almost anticipates its intentions. With precision, he parries the attack, alters its path, and lightly touches the headless knight. Counting one, Leon readies his sword once more, aiming it directly at the knight, his voice resonating with determination as he declares, the second round begins now. Unfazed, the headless knight raises its sword, preparing for another powerful strike. Hari and Jinsu, witnessing the intense clash become increasingly concerned for Leon's safety. Ever the discerning critic, he critiques the knight's flawed footwork and swiftly brings it down. Jinsu and the group can scarcely believe what they've seen, their faces displaying a mix of astonishment and bewilderment. Hari finds the turn of events nearly unbelievable. The chief turns to her, seeking confirmation of the battle's outcome. Among them, 
she stands as the sole individual truly comprehending the intricate nature of the duel. Filled with awe in her voice, she explains how Leon is indeed altering the trajectory of his opponent's sword precisely at the moment their blades make contact, executing a daring crosscut. It is a maneuver rarely attempted by anyone. Undeterred by his defeat, the headless knight stands, resolute against Leon's determination. Displaying a mix of admiration and amusement, he lightly touches the knight with the tip of his sword for the second time, once again counting the strike as two. He instructs the knight to return to the starting position, acknowledging the overpowering resilience of his opponent. The ongoing duel between Leon and the headless knight showcases their skill and unwavering resolve with each clash of their blades. He ponders, realizing it's been a while since he encountered a knight who treats him as one and has requested a duel. It's likely a ploy to evade a difficult situation. Anyone would have thought that when they heard the suggestion to get off the horse. It's nonsense. The Night King, standing tall with an unwavering posture, possesses the demeanor of a seasoned veteran whose history is woven with numerous battles. His starry eyes, ceaselessly pursuing honor and eminence, command attention. He contemplates his strategy, preparing to face the upcoming sword attack. As his foe launches another assault, he accepts each strike with grace, expertly blocking and countering with ease. With a flick of his wrist, he tosses aside the knight's sword and lightly touches him for the third time, who believes himself to embody an honorable knight. Leon, offering a chance for an honorable yield, asks the knight if he wishes to continue. The headless knight, being the king of knights, prefers the challenge of fighting as a knight rather than relying on necromancy. He desires to engage with Leon countless times, embracing the knightly way. Charging at Leon once more, he launches a relentless series of attacks, yet each strike is effortlessly parried. The knight wishes not to employ necromancy but solely to wield his blade, reminiscing about dueling famed knights in his past wanderings, honoring the knightly tradition he's forgotten. Leon's movements flow with a grace that contrasts the enemy's raw power. He doesn't need to exert himself much, while the headless knight grows increasingly fatigued. Just before Leon touches him for the tenth time, he skillfully disarms the knight, flinging his sword away. He commends the knight, acknowledging the improvement in his swordsmanship, and inquires if he's starting to regain memories from his past life. Confirming Leon's inquiry, the knight expresses that indeed, he's returning to the glorious days of his past. Leon addresses the headless knight, expressing his desire to continue the duel. The knight calls upon one of his loyal skeletons, which holds his detached head, indulging in a moment of reminiscence about his extensive history of causing massacres. He reflects on how long he's fought without honor lamenting the wasted years. Filled with newfound purpose, he declares that ending his life in this honorable manner would bring him joy. He lifts his head and offers it to Leon as a symbol of their dual significance. Filled with a mixture of joy and respect, Leon accepts the once headless knight's gesture. Placing his hand on the knight's head, he offers a prayer, a gentle plea for solace and rest. A bright light illuminates the cave, its radiant glow emanating from the knight and spreading throughout. Leon expresses his happiness at the knight's regained honor. He prays, wishing that if the knight had a god he believed in, it would grant his soul respite. And if no god accompanied him, he hoped that a benevolent force would guide him on his journey's end. Expressing his desire to reunite with the knight someday, perhaps at a festival in the halls of the gods, Leon watches as the light grows larger, enveloping the knight's helmet and armor, dissolving them into nothingness. As the death knight lets out one final prayer, he beseeches, let glory lie with Leon Dragonia Lionheart. As the brilliance fades, the group finds themselves back in the familiar surroundings of the rice fields. Hari, filled with admiration, informs Jinsu that Leon is indeed keeping his promise by resolving the matter through a duel. They ponder the nature of the magic Leon is displaying, its intricacies and origins. Hari remarks that he should have used that remarkable ability earlier in the battle. Overhearing their conversation, Leon explains that if he had done so, the headless knight would have perished as a necromancer. Hari greets him, appreciating his wisdom and adherence to the principles of honor. He continues to elaborate, emphasizing that a true knight lives for honor, and honor is born from deeds. Deeds can only happen when one possesses the will to undertake them. In the end, the headless knight receives what he deserves, an honorable defeat that restores his lost honor. Leon wonders aloud about the whereabouts of the knight, shifting the focus to their next objective. Hari, Jinsu and Leon inspect the spoils of the duel, the knight's sword, a cloak, and a mysterious purple orb radiating with a vibrant violet aura. While Hari and Jinsu are surprised to see the loot, 
Lian remains unimpressed. Jin Su immediately notices the ball's significance and determines that it costs too much. To his dismay, Lian destroys it without hesitation, stunning everyone present. He explains that such items only bring chaos and destruction. A notification appears, the final result, Delahan's cap, Delahan's great sword, and mana stones. With that, the Honam gate is cleared. Later at the association, Hari lets out a deep sigh, standing still, holding a cart filled with expensive food. Her face is filled with dread as Leon, only four days on earth, has already caused her to lose all hope. The first problem arose when Hari approached Leon about taxes. He shouted at her, questioning how a king of another nation could be asked to pay taxes. She suggested that he could pay using mana stones, but Leon dismissed the idea, stating that a king does not count his coins. She recalls that he questioned her as to why she was discussing these matters when they should be handled by people under him, telling her to stop talking about coins as it's not his job. Hurry's face turns into a perplexed expression, thinking, what the heck man? As she just tried to do her job. The second problem was when they gained new followers due to the introduction of divine power into the land. An elder asked how much they should pay in taxes, and with a serious face, Leon replied that they should pay him $19 trillion and 90% of their crops. His sarcastic tone causes the elder to step back in fear. The taxes and the cost of living were already overwhelming, and the requirement of 90% of their crop yield seemed insane. Interrupting, Leon states that as followers of the goddess, they shouldn't worry about being hungry. He assured them that welfare, cost of living, and food would be taken care of by his guild. Hari then showed them a piece of paper revealing the insanely high appraisal value of the rice, 15 billion and one for 80 kilograms of blessed rice, surprising the elders. They praised Leon, realizing the enormous wealth they could amass, even after the 90% tax deduction, believing money reigns supreme. However, the primary concern remained Leon's residence. In the apartment, as Leon entered he began shouting, lamenting how it resembles a battlefield. He complained about the absence of artwork, expressing his frustrations in a fit of rage. Demanding a luxurious bed, standby servants, and constant access to artwork, he left Hari speechless. Hours pass, with Hari tirelessly making calls until 2 a.m., seeking luxurious accommodation for the king in five-star hotels. She even kneeled, imploring him to rest. Eventually, a compromise struck. They settled on displaying a painting or ceramic piece in the room. In the present, Hari calls out to Leon, addressing him as Your Majesty. He invites her in, and she approaches with a cart, though extremely exhausted she inquires about his well-being. He assures her that he is all right. She informs him that it's time for breakfast. He inquires if she has eaten, and she admits she hasn't. Advising her to eat whenever she can, he emphasizes the importance of not skipping meals. Hari takes note of his advice, eyeing the variety of delicious food laid out on the table for him. She contemplates enjoying a sandwich later but he surprises her by insisting that she takes a seat. Shocked and touched by the gesture, Hari tears up at the thought of sharing a meal with him. Calling him your majesty, she giggles happily as she sits at the table. However, Leon interrupts her, questioning her actions with an intense glare that confuses her. He asks about her expression instead of ensuring that the ribs are easy to eat for him, she explains she thought they were going to share the food. Leon refutes that notion stating that a country's king and peasants do not dine together. She falls silent, refraining from further speech. Below the hotel, a black limousine is seen. She informs Leon about the Hunter Association's decision to provide him with support, funding, and resettlement aid. She ensures him that while it may not be as good as a palace, they've ensured his comfort. He responds with gratitude, stating that he shouldn't ask for too much as he's just a guest. He leaves it to them to handle. Turning to ask about the loot distribution, she is reminded by him to take care of it herself. However, he expresses his desire for the cape as he likes it. Nervously agreeing, Hari proceeds, and they soon arrive at a beautiful tall building. Informing Leon about their proximity to the Hunter Association and the building's helicopter pad on the top floor for convenience, she remarks, Not bad, your majesty. He simply grants a response. While there, he spots a statue resembling something peculiar, and wonders what it could be expressing his confusion about it. As they enter the building, to Hari's surprise, someone greets them. She had thought Leon's presence here was meant to be a secret and asked the person who they were. The man, Park Jungchan, introduces himself as a member of the Du Young group and the director of food of the future. 
Hari smiles upon hearing the name De Young Group, acknowledging it as one of the nation's three major conglomerates, a really wealthy company. She wonders why a director is waiting for them. Jung Chan's glance carries an unsettling intention as he reaches out his hand to shake Leon's, remarking about the famous survivor. Hari realizes that he already knew about their arrival. With an evil smile, he greets Leon as Dragonia Lionheart, but he remains silent, his expression one of disgust, questioning why a mere merchant wants to shake hands with him. Later on, Hari and Leon find themselves in a room. She explains to him that the Hunter Association will provide this place for a year, covering utilities, rent, and offering room service and cleaning. As he stares out of the window, he simply acknowledges. She feels relieved knowing that information regarding survivors is top secret, especially given Jung Chan's unknown intentions. She's glad Leon ignored the director. Curious, Hari turns to ask Leon about earlier why Jung Chan wanted to see him. He replies with a blunt observation that there's only one thing a merchant would want, profit. The word echoes in Hari's mind, and she soon realizes it's because of the blessed rice in the Honan Plains. Urgently, the management of information didn't go smoothly, as a streamer recorded the situation despite the Hunter Association's request for deletion. Glancing at her phone, Hari realizes the video was re-uploaded under the account named Farmer Mr. Park. The scene shifts, Jung Chan's phone is shown, and he's angrily cursing at Leon, calling him an arrogant little savage. He questions a worker about the rice's effects, expressing concern as it hasn't been tested on humans yet, only on rats. The worker hesitates to answer immediately. Suddenly, a lady enters and informs him that they visited the owner of the rice field to gather more information. She explains that a dying dog miraculously recovered fully after consuming the rice. Furthermore, people suffering from various illnesses, chronic inflammation, and sinus infections experienced improvements and were cured after eating the rice. She adds that both minor and major diseases throughout the village were seemingly cured by the rice's consumption. Jung Chan's smile broadens upon hearing the confirmation of the rice's effects, validating its potential on rats despite the lack of human testing data. However, his expression quickly shifts to anger as he recalls Leon's dismissive words, referring to him as a mere merchant despite his position as the head of the Duyun group. The lady emphasizes the necessity of acquiring the rice at all costs due to its unparalleled potential. His grimace intensifies, and he slams his hand onto the table loudly, questioning how Leon dares to look down on them. His rage intensifies as he perceives Leon's actions as a provocation, believing that he has picked the wrong enemy over something as trivial as fancy rice. With a smirk, Jung Chan sees Leon as akin to other survivors, whom he deems arrogant for thinking their world is superior. He contemplates unsettling Leon with a cultural clash as he dials his phone, muttering the word savage in frustration. Upon his return to Earth, Leon had set himself three goals. The first one involves spreading faith and divinity. Earth hosts numerous gods and followers, but the absence of actual divine power is a critical concern. A true god is meant to embody faith and bestow blessings upon the world. Yet, humanity is plagued by illnesses, and the lands are growing increasingly contaminated. To harness divine power, there's a crucial need for a new faith, highlighting the importance of more people believing in a fresh deity. The second goal involves the establishment of the Knights Templar on Earth, an organization of fighters that currently doesn't exist using divine power. If the Guardian of the Holy Grail, the King of the Lion Heart, is considered a demigod, then the Knights Templar are regarded as saints. They embody the essence of divine power, wielding it against evil forces with fervor and dedication. The last objective revolves around eradicating all evil on earth by reclaiming divine power and elevating the Knights Templar. Standing beside a window he ponders the necessity of spreading the faith and preserving balance within the pantheon to elevate the Knights Templar, even though the concept of their existence on earth might seem implausible. However, such thoughts don't concern him much. When Hari informs him about an official meeting request, he suggests there's no harm in hearing the person out, given they've followed proper procedures. Later, Jung Chan and two others enter the room where Leon is seated. The director expresses gratitude to Leon for granting the meeting. But as he gazes thoughtfully at him, it seems as though he's delving into the man's very essence. Internally, Jung Chan contemplates whether, for the sake of business, he should lower himself to this foolish man, referring to Leon as a foolish savage. Despite his internal musings, he smiles, presenting a large silver case to Leon, encouraging him to accept it, anticipating surprise at its contents. He unveils top-tier luxury items before Leon, items believing that Leon could never imagine encountering. 
he anticipates that once Leon experiences these items, he won't be able to go back. It's a move that Jungchan is convinced that it will make Leon beg to become his manager. With pride in his voice, Leon acknowledges Jungchan's effort and decides to accept the gift. Meanwhile, Jungchan ponders Leon's manner of accepting the gift, seemingly as if he's doing a favor by taking it. Externally, he maintains a smiling facade, encouraging Leon to inspect the gift, believing he'll appreciate it. Unfazed, Leon tells Hari that there's no need for elaborate explanations on etiquette. He simply instructs her to open the gift. She nods in agreement and approaches the silver case, tapping it lightly, causing steam and smoke to billow out, startling her as she observes its contents. Meanwhile, Jungchan chuckles softly as the case reveals a collection of elite weapons, renowned possessions of their group. He intends for Leon to choose whatever he desires. Hari intrigued, asks if these weapons are uniquely ranked items crafted by the master craftsmen of the Dujun group. Jungchan, brimming with pride, confirms that all the weapons are indeed of unique rank, the best of the best. He explains to Leon that as he's transitioning into becoming a hunter, these weapons would be incredibly beneficial. Hari is taken aback by the generous offer of such extraordinary weapons. Her mind races at the thought of possessing items that couldn't even be bought with money. She had only seen them on YouTube back when she was a student. However, Leon declines the offer, deeming these magnificent weapons as low-ranked. Both Hari and Jungchan are shocked at how dismissively Leon regards these remarkable weapons. He clarifies his stance, stating that a good sword cannot be forged without the star's aura or a holy blessing. He questions whether they solely rely on weapons to hunt beasts, causing sweat to trickle down Jung's face as he ponders Leon's thoughts. He interprets Leon's words as implying that weapons should be sun-dried like peppers and receive blessings from a priest. He labels Jung an unfaithful merchant, but he dismisses it as a misunderstanding. Leon further remarks that merchants are obligated to flaunt their items wherever they go. Conjuring a sword in the air, he considers Jung's weapons suitable only for killing chickens and cows. Nevertheless, he's willing to give them a try. Jungchan and his men are astonished to witness Leon summoning an old sword into the air, wondering if that's all he possesses and if he gravely underestimated their weaponry. Jungchan expresses his desire to see what Leon's sword could do and asks Hari if she'd be willing to try one of those weapons. She is taken aback by the request but seeks approval from Leon, who nods in agreement. As Hari approaches the silver case, she contemplates her choice. Eventually, her hand finds the handle of a sword, and upon unsheathing it, a sharp blade emitting a red aura is revealed. This particular sword, named Dawn and crafted by the renowned master craftsman Park Jian Chul, had been Hari's admiration for four years. Examining it closely, she feels its power, realizing it has absorbed dense sun energies from a special gate for ten days. When she seeks Leon's approval to wield the sword, he questions why she needs permission to swing what he considers a mere toy causing internal frustration for Jungchan, who silently insults Leon. Prepared, Hari gears up to swing the sword at Leon's blade, concentration enveloping her as flames start to encircle her weapon. Meanwhile, Leon maintains a composed stance, flexing his blade. With determination, she raises the sword high, its flames erupting fiercely with incredible power. Prepared, Hari gears up to swing the sword at Leon's blade, concentration enveloping her as flames start to encircle her weapon. Meanwhile, Leon maintains a composed stance, flexing his blade. With determination, she raises the sword high, its flames erupting fiercely with incredible power. As she swings down, releasing torrents of flames, she exclaims, Here I go. Yet, to the surprise of both her and Jungchan, her blade shatters into pieces. Hari stands frozen in disbelief as her sword breaks while Leon's blade remains unscathed by her powerful attack. Leon casually sets aside his sword, deeming Zhang Chan's weapon worse than anticipated and a complete waste of time. With a piercing glare at Zhang Chan, he declares that the meeting will be limited to three minutes. Zhang Chan, appearing submissive, is unable to respond, grappling to regain his composure after witnessing the Du Jun group's supposed strongest weapon shatter before him. Zhang Chan and his group bow their heads, humbly seeking patent rights over the rice grains from Leon. Perplexed, Leon seeks clarification prompting Jun to swiftly assure him of their willingness to pay. He confidently states that the group is offering 180 billion for the rights. Jung Chan is well aware that the rice capable of curing cancer is worth far more than the offered amount. However, he knows that the savage Leon does not understand the true value of 180 billion won. Explaining the worth to him could drive him crazy. 
When Leon inquires if Jung wants to buy the rice with money, he agrees, but with a condition, Leon must sign a contract granting the Du Jung group a cartel over it. He even suggests that if Leon desires, he can increase the price a bit. Upon hearing this, anger flares within Leon like a glorious lion. He questions Jung Chan, asking if he dares to insult divinity. Leon, with his immense strength, is known as the Big Lion. His fury leaves Jung Chan and his group overwhelmed and powerless. They resemble frightened little puppies in his intimidating presence. Jung Chan trembles in fear convinced that his life will end as he faces Leon resembling a gigantic lion with fiery glowing eyes. Leon looks at him, calling him a fool and stating that he has confessed his sins. Overwhelmed, he falls to his knees and admits that he doesn't fully comprehend his mistake. With a gesture, Leon releases the immense pressure and questions his ignorance and lack of civility. Leon explains that the crops come from land blessed by the goddess Demera. This blessing rewards hard-working farmers who sweat and labor in the fields. It's not merely purchasable with money. A grateful heart and faith serve as necessary payment. Leon criticizes him, branding him as childish and a lowly creature who solely pursues profits by deceiving others in the process. He questions Jungchan's desire to possess divine products from a goddess he doesn't believe in. Afterward, Jungchan leaves and as night falls outside, Hari questions Leon's decision to let him go so easily. She highlights Jungchan's significant influence despite being a lowly merchant. However, he dismisses the idea, stating that he's unaffected by someone as vulgar as him as he considers it unworthy of concern. He changes the subject and asks if she has prepared what he requested. Hari brings something over and mentions the association's call. She asks him if he plans on taking the test himself and suggests it might simplify things. He is surprised by the suggestion and questions the absurdity of her advice as she is asking about needing a test as a king. Shocked by his response, she asks how he intends to proceed. He reveals his plan to search for skilled soldiers and asserts that he will personally test them. Hari quietly acknowledges the difficulty of his request, but he insists on making it possible. It brings tears to her eyes. After a few days, a black car is parked outside a large building. Inside, a surprised voice to see him here this year too. He greets someone, mentioning he hasn't seen team manager Kim Dohan for a long time. He introduces himself as Gu Daesung, an unaffiliated hunter of D-rank. Dohan speculates whether Daesung is there for a retest, praising his dedication and hard work. He inquires about Daesung's progress this year and predicts a swift rise in his rank. Daesung replies that he has to give his best shot. The old man extends an invitation for Daesung to join his team. The boy contemplates that even those without exceptional talent attain a C rank, yet he's remained a D rank hunter for ten years. Dohun praises his dedication and competence, assuring him that he'll swiftly become an ace. He mentions that while people consider mining as hard labor, being on the team isn't bad. Daesung acknowledges his ten years of hard work but is resolute in his determination to continue improving. He reflects on his family and the challenge of repaying debts with earnings from dungeon raids. He needs to raise his rank to see to no longer be a burden. Dohun looks surprised and informs Daesung about a foreigner who caught their attention. They ponder whether he's European or a foreign laborer. Despite his fair complexion, they're surprised and wonder if there are still economically struggling countries in the West. They notice Leon, who carries himself with a royal air. A voice calls out to Leon, referring to him as a young man, catching his attention. The elderly approaches and greets Leon, who remains silent exuding a menacing presence. Leon questions why a commoner is addressing him. Dohun witnesses the profound unease etched on Daesung's face as if his very soul had abandoned him. He's still anxious and tells Daesung that the foreigner learned Korean in a peculiar manner which he acknowledges. When Leon locks eyes with Daesung, he trembles in fear, sensing the overwhelming aura emanating from Leon's dominant presence. Dohun questions Daesung about what's wrong as he notices him trembling. He can't help but wonder what's happening as he feels small and insignificant under Leon's immense pressure. An employee calls out for number 57, instructing Gu Daesung to proceed to interview room 2. He acknowledges and prepares to go, but Leon's intense gaze unsettles him during the interaction with the employee. Leon contemplates his disappointment, realizing that he didn't come here for strong individuals as no one seems worthy of becoming his soldier. He considers that only low-ranked individuals or recent awakenings bother to take the test. Then, an announcement calls for number 77, Leon Dragonia Lionheart, to proceed to interview room 9. He ponders that he can't expect much from the outset. 
Upon entering the room, he finds others already inside. One man addresses the king by his name, Leon Dragonia, but Leon rebukes him, demanding to be addressed as, Your Majesty. Initially stunned, the man complies and adopts the respectful address. They request him to place his hand on a measuring device for the test. Leon intensely contemplates its purpose, delving deeply into its meaning. The instructor, noticing Leon's reaction, checks his chart, but Leon labels him a fool, leaving the instructor bewildered. He argues, questioning how a peasant could dare to test the honor of a knight. The instructor attempts to clarify that the device conducts the test, not them, but he remains upset, criticizing the judges. He asserts that only honorable knights and gods can measure knightly strength, expressing disbelief that a mere machine could do so. The judges express shock and confusion, questioning Leon's presence. In response, he clarifies that he arrived in search of capable soldiers, only to be disheartened by the realization that even the judges themselves appear to be lacking in competence. The judges are taken aback to realize that Leon is openly headhunting. He informs them that there's no one he finds suitable and inquires about the next test. The judges then inform him about a test at the gate. Leon acknowledges that real skills are demonstrated through consistent training and realistic situations. His agreement to participate surprises the judges. At the sole gate, a voice asks if anyone feels dizzy or unwell, mentioning that some people suffer from ocean sickness passing through the gate. The sole gate, which typically closes after clearance, is left open for specific situations, serving as an example here. Daesung reflects that this year's strength measurement isn't much different from the previous year, realizing he needs to excel here for better results. A girl admires the place's interior and asks her older brother if it's a popular spot, but he advises her to turn off her phone. Daesung notices them, recognizing the newcomers. An old man nearby comments on the pleasant air. He observes the old man, estimating that they're all either D or C ranked hunters. However, when he turns around, he spots Leon whom he recognizes as a foreign laborer. He considers Leon a newcomer due to his age and presence for testing. He worries that, except for the old man, everyone else seems inexperienced. Concerned, he wonders if everything will be all right. Leon, sporting sunglasses and emitting a cool vibe, grabs his attention once more. As the group assembles in the middle of the fields, they begin with introductions before assessing their positions. Daesung introduces himself, saying that this marks his tenth year as a hunter. He specializes as a warrior and primarily serves as a dealer. The siblings follow with their introductions. Taehoon, having awakened this year, wields a shield and spear, while Nayan primarily uses daggers and is learning archery. Daesung is surprised, realizing that they are complete beginners who haven't settled on their main weapons. He inquires if they have undergone training at the center, and the siblings enthusiastically mention their three-month training which leaves him in further shock. He then approaches the old man, Gangtae, who introduces himself as being in his fifth year and using a gauntlet as his weapon. Despite awakening, he recently resigned. Daesung fears that the old man's experience might be lacking despite his age, especially since he uses a gauntlet which indicates that he's a close-range fighter. Turning to the last person, Leon, he asks if he is a foreign laborer or if he speaks Korean. In response, he stares in silence for a moment and then declares that he does not fight. He explains that he cannot use a sword meant for slaying dragons, to kill chickens. This confuses the dealer even more, making him wonder where Leon learned Korean. As the group travels through the forest, they recall the test requirements, hunting down fifty kobolds. They remember the instructor's advice that occasionally a gnome might appear on the field, and if it posed too much danger, he'd step in, relieving them of worry and allowing them to focus solely on showcasing their skills. Daesung remains worried as he turns to glance at his team members, noticing Taehoon looking nervous. He wonders if the test will go smoothly, considering what happened earlier. A flashback reveals Daesung asking Leon if he brought any weapons that stun the team. Nayan then approaches Leon, addressing him as handsome Opa, and offers him weapons like the bow and arrow, asking if he knows how to use them. Leon grips the bow, staring at it, and asks her if she wants him to use it. She happily agrees, telling him he can return it later. Anger surges within him as he tightly grips the bow. He slams it onto the ground, shouting that a knight doesn't use a long-range weapon like a coward. The team is shocked by his outburst as Nayan cries out, My bow. Daesung is left speechless, looking on with a stunned expression, while the team questions Leon's actions. The instructor chuckles and advises them to get going. 
Back in the present, Daesung continues to think that at this rate, the test might fail, leading the group. He turns to them, saying he knows of a location, and asks if they want to go there to hunt. The siblings agree while Leon remains silent. The old man is happy either way. Taehoon then tells Daesung about a settlement at the end of the terrain, mentioning that there would be many kobolds there. Daesung notes his advice but explains it is not a good idea as their group is too small, and it's almost impossible to get out once they are surrounded. He suggests hunting the kobolds in caves and proposes to set nearby grass and leaves on fire to create smoke and then proceed to the caves for an easier hunt. The siblings are impressed by his plan and praise his expertise. However, he modestly laughs off their compliments, recognizing it as nothing to boast about. He had studied tutorials and various methods, aspiring to enter a higher rank gate, but circumstances led him to this particular one. Despite this, passionate determination drives him as he's tired of remaining in D-rank for so long and is determined to advance this time. Suddenly, Taehoon stutters out a warning, shouting, Kobolds, as a group of them appears. Daesung swiftly unsheaths his sword, directing the boy to block the incoming kobolds with his shield. As the creatures rush toward them, something crashes into one of their faces. Taehoon wonders if they are foolish for running straight at him, finding it easy to block their attacks. Stunned, he faces another one flying toward him. Just then, Nayan screams, warning him about one in front of him. Daesung manages to intervene in time and saves Taehoon. He grabs and slams it into the ground. Fear grips the young lad as Kobold gets stabbed right before him. He warns him not to lower his guard, emphasizing that the Kobolds are swift, despite their weakness. Despite Daesung's warning, Taehoon continues to scream as other Kobolds are shot down with arrows and one is punched in the jaw. The old man, Gangtae, effortlessly dispatches a kobold with his fists. Eventually, they are defeated by almost everyone on the team, earning praise from the instructor. Taehoon apologizes for his mistake, feeling disheartened, but Daesung assures him that it's understandable as it was his first encounter. He commends Nayan for her two kills, and the elderly ensure that everyone is unharmed, bringing smiles to their faces. Reflecting, Daesung thinks that he can handle it as he starts with anxiety, but considers it a decent party, except for one person. He feels uneasy, noticing Leon standing still and seemingly curious. He questions Leon about his lack of participation, while the group expresses their dissatisfaction with him merely observing from a distance, wondering if it's acceptable behavior. Nervously, the instructor assures them that he'll take this into account while grading. They collectively decide to venture deeper into the forest toward a cave. Daesung suggests continuing onward, assuring them they'll reach the cave soon. As they arrive, he instructs them to gather dry leaves and branches at the entrance to set a fire as planned. While preparing to light the fire, Leon confronts him and questions the effectiveness of his plan. He defends his method and points out Leon's lack of assistance during their mission. In a serious tone, Leon asks him if that's truly the best he can do, warning him not to make him repeat himself. Daesung asserts that he has used this method successfully three times before, but Leon challenges his reliance on past experience questioning how he can depend on it with limited understanding. This enrages Daesung, who shouts back, disregarding Leon's age and claims that experience doesn't matter. In defiance, he proceeds to light the fire and fill the air with smoke. As it fills the cave, they brace themselves for the incoming kobolds. Taehoon shouts a warning about their presence. When the kobolds charge out, the group retaliates, wielding their weapons. Despite the chaos, Daesung remains confident in his method urging the others to eliminate all the creatures. He ponders the potential gains of gathering kobolds here and even targeting a few gnolls in the plains will be good. But their progress is abruptly halted by intense growling. The sound sends shivers down his spine and causes him to spin around as sweat drips from his face. He recognizes the growl and knows that it's a gnoll captain, an entity with red glowing eyes emerges from the trees, breathing heavily. Daesung realizes that the gnoll captain is the boss of the Soul Station Gate a rank higher than the sea. It lets out a fierce roar directed at Daesung, instilling fear in him. He wonders why it had to appear at that moment. As the Knoll captain continues its intense growling in the forest, Nayan calls out to the frozen Daesung. He eventually issues instructions. He and Taehoon will confront the creature while Nayan and Grandpa will handle the kobolds in the cave. Rushing into battle against the Knoll captain, Daesung reflects on his decision to have an experienced member in each team realizing that an inexperienced D-rank facing the knoll is akin to suicide. As he and Taehoon close in on the captain from different angles, 
Daesun knows that he has to trust the lad, despite his novice status. However, fear grips Taehoon as he faces the creature, whose fierce stare triggers tears in his eyes. Despite raising his shield, he trembles in terror as the knoll roars directly at him. Daesung sees the boy's state of extreme intimidation and tries to encourage him, urging him to gather himself. However, Daesung realizes that Taehoon is too overwhelmed at the moment. As he observes the impending strike from the knoll captain, he knows that Taehoon won't be able to block the attack in his current state. In an agonizing moment, the kid screams in pain as the force of the knoll captain's hit knocks him to the ground, causing his shield to fly from his arm. Daesung shouts out to him with concern, inwardly frustrated at the situation. Taehoon trembles in fear, attempting to scream but stuttering in terror. Daesung, observing the instructor, wonders why he isn't intervening despite his earlier assurance that he would step in when things became dangerous. In a moment of urgency, he sees the impending danger to the young kid's life and curses under his breath, biting his lips in frustration. He swiftly dashes toward the discarded shield on the ground, equipping it, and urgently shouts for Taehoon to move away. The enemy prepares for another strike, raising its sword menacingly. The heavy blow lands where the kid had been standing, causing the ground to shatter from the force of the attack. However, to its surprise, a shiny object emerges from the debris of its strike. Daesung successfully manages to block the attack just in time, using the shield to save Taehoon's life. He struggles fiercely, yelling out as he exerts all his strength. He pushes against the Knoll Captain's sword with the shield, creating sparks. He manages to drive the sword into the ground with the shield. This action only further enrages the creature and causes it to crawl out and prepare for another attack. As it raises its sword once again, Daesung anticipates the impending strike and raises the shield in an attempt to block it though he doubts if he can manage. Amidst the chaos, he reflects on how they could have defeated it if Taehoon had managed to gather himself. However, in their current state, it seems that they are all facing the threat of imminent death. However, a voice interrupts, remarking, Not too bad. Simultaneously, a hand emerges, effortlessly seizing the oncoming sword with just two fingers, positioning himself between the Knoll Captain and Daesung. With one hand holding the sword and the other in his pocket, Leon calmly encourages Daesung and tells him to try again. Daesung, bewildered by what he's witnessing, questions Leon's action, unsure if he truly stopped the attack with just one finger. Leon locks eyes with him and instructs him to raise his shield to face the Knoll Captain once more. He asks him why he couldn't replicate his previous action. He urges him to get up and lift his shield, further perplexing Daesung with his cryptic words. His unexpected actions add further confusion for both Dae Sung and the Knoll Captain. Dae Sung, frustrated and alarmed, yells at Leon, questioning why he couldn't see the perilous situation they were in and how they were all in danger. In response, Leon raises his voice with his eyes shining brightly and berates Dae Sung. He calls him an impertinent peasant. He exclaims, How dare you defy me after witnessing the glory of the King of the Lion Heart's guidance? He continues his scolding and emphasizes that for a Templar like himself to guide peasant soldiers is an honor that will be passed down for generations. He criticizes Daesung for not expressing gratitude for his guidance. The Knoll Captain, like everyone else, is left perplexed by the unfolding situation. Despite the confusion, Leon persistently shouts at the dealer and instructs him to raise his shield, block, and counterattack. Daesung, uncertain of his actions, grips his shield fully aware of the menacing presence of the Knoll Captain. He knows that he needs to act to survive. As the Knoll growls and directs its aggression towards Leon, Daesung observes in confusion. Leon, however, remains silent initially but then emits a powerful yellow aura and addresses the adversary provocatively. He questions if the creature desires its own demise. In response to Leon's display of dominance, the Knoll Captain shows signs of fear and whimpers and trembles in the face of his overwhelming presence. Meanwhile, Dae Sung, caught amid the chaos, braces himself as the Knoll sword aims toward him. Raising his shield to deflect the incoming attack, he realizes the immense strength behind the strike as he nearly loses his grip on the shield. Leon, frustrated with his approach, criticizes him for relying solely on the shield's strength in combat. He shouts at Dae Sung and demands that he not confront a stronger opponent head-on but instead deflect attacks and search for an opening. Leon emphasizes that merely defending against the opponent won't lead to victory, as the Knoll Captain is not a static target, but a living creature that is capable of learning. As Daesung continues blocking the Knoll Captain's attacks, Leon's admonishments persist, and he urges him to use his intellect in the battle. 
However, Dae Sun is struggling to keep up with the defense and expresses his difficulty in comprehending how to implement Leon's advice. Leon takes action and kicks the dealer in the back of the leg which causes him to narrowly evade the incoming attack. He advises Dae Sun not to divert his attention from the opponent and urges him to stay focused and engaged in the fight. Dae Sun notices the close call, realizing that his hair was nearly clipped by that invasion, and acknowledges that a direct block would have been fatal. Leon urges him to concentrate and not let his potential go to waste. He encourages him to harness his capabilities. Despite Leon's encouragement, Dae Sung struggles to believe in his potential. He views himself as an untalented D rank hunter without any remarkable skills. Dae Sung, still raising his shield in front of the Knoll Captain, finds it hard to accept the sudden notion of possessing untapped potential just because Leon believes in it. However, a surge of determination begins to well up inside him. Daesung starts to feel a newfound sense of resolve and believes that this time, he might be able to overcome the challenges ahead despite his initial doubts. He is fueled by determination, and responds to the Knoll Captain's fierce roar with a howl of his own, internally rallying himself to believe that he can overcome the challenge. He screams his conviction mentally, affirming his belief in his ability to succeed even as the sword inches closer to his shield. With a thunderous impact, the sword strikes Daesung's shield, creates sparks, and causes a crack to appear. Despite the force of the attack, he manages to deflect the Knoll Captain's strike to the side. Overwhelmed by disbelief initially, he soon finds himself filled with elation and exclaims aloud that he succeeded in blocking the attack. However, his jubilation is abruptly interrupted as the adversary swiftly lands a sucker punch directly on Daesung's face, and it sends him flying backward. In a state of shock, he can only wonder in disbelief about the unexpected turn of events. Leon stands there, reflecting on why the dealer failed to see the full picture. Dae Sung remains unconscious on the ground and received AD in his evaluation this year. In the real world, a voice asks Leon if he was already aware from the start. He denies the possibility of a warrior like him being a mere mercenary. The voice belongs to Oh Kong Hyuk, the president of the Korean Hunter Association, who chuckles at his response, mentioning that even a bewitching mask couldn't disguise him entirely. He inquires if Leon achieved what he wanted from the evaluation. He responds, stating that he found a potential soldier candidate, showing no intentions of heading overseas, surprising the president. Kang Hyuk closes his eyes and shares with Leon that he understands his thoughts. He is feeling a bit nervous due to the astounding power the knight displayed. He reminisces about witnessing Leon's encounter with the Knoll Captain, impressed by his abilities. In flashback, Leon addresses the Knoll Captain disdainfully, comments on its failed attempt to transform into a human, and questions how long it intends to gaze at him so reverently. With a casual flick of a finger, he criticizes the knoll. Kang Hyuk chuckles at the memory, noting how Leon treated the monster as if it were a toy, but he dismisses it, stating that the creature wasn't even worthy of being a toy. Shifting the conversation, Kang Hyuk brings up Leon's desire to establish a guild and assures him of their assistance. He admits that fame is crucial when creating an organization, realizing the limited pathways to fame in the present times. Kang Hyuk then shifts the discussion to a peculiar gate in Chongju that has turned red after a failed raid. For a year, no one has managed to clear it, either to destroy or obtain the coveted jewel of wisdom. It is guarded by the Red Gate's boss, the Jagged Spinner. In a flashback at the Chongju Sports Complex gate, the first team, known as the KPP Guild, initiates a raid. A group of hunters assemble to observe and explore the area. One member of the group inquires to another, about the place. The man responds, suggesting that it resembles a modern civilization, potentially more advanced than Earth. A female member expresses excitement, describing the gate as being from a future world. The man speculates that just as there are fantasy and neurim worlds, why not a future world? Another member remarks to the guild master that it has a more cyberpunk vibe to it. The guild master expresses frustration and mentions that it's troublesome and they need to reconsider their plan starting with how they've organized the party. Another member agrees and states that their organization was based on the assumption of facing a few formidable opponents. Surveying the area, the guild master spots a building and informs the group that they'll use it as their base camp. He notes its elevated position, offering a good vantage point. The group then proceeds to enter the building. Once inside, the guild master asks a member named Hoyle if he notices anything, but he reports back that there's nothing as there are no NPCs or monsters in sight. The guild master inquires about Jag Spinner who is supposed to be the boss here, but Hoyle reports that he couldn't spot it either. 
They find it peculiar that a city of this size lacks people or monsters. The guild master initially considers it fortunate and suggests they may not be facing a resistance army or an evil authoritarian force. He gathers his guild members' attention and explains that despite entering the gate, they lack information about Jag Spinner. He instructs them to stay vigilant and mentions selecting an expedition team to map the area. However, a sudden laser appears and explosively disrupts his head as he speaks. Hoyle witnesses blood splattering around and calls out the guild master's name in shock. The other members stare at the gruesome scene as pieces of Hunso's head are scattered everywhere. A machine equipped with a rail gun, crackling with electricity, is revealed to be the source of the attack. Members panic and shout that they are under fire, and they urgently need to seek cover. The machine unveils another barrel and points it in their direction, and a massive explosion engulfs the building from above. Panic ensues, and members scramble to escape the explosions. Some are unfortunately caught in the blasts. It prompts Hoyle to call out to a member struck by the attack. He shouts in frustration and ponders how the A-rank guild master couldn't react in time. He questions what kind of monster they are facing. Seeking cover behind rubble, he expresses fear that they might die if they don't locate the enemy. A nearby member points to the enemy's possible location at 3 o'clock but can't estimate the distance due to the dust. She warns that the building won't hold much longer. This urgency prompts Hoyle to command everyone to retreat. He urgently instructs them to hurry outside as the building is on the verge of collapsing. As they run to escape, the female member asks Hoyle about the guild master's body. He refuses to dwell on retrieving the master's body and emphasizes that they can do it once they have regrouped. He instructs a team member Hyrie to check the exit. She agrees and rushes ahead to check the opening. Upon reaching the exit, she signals that it seems safe, sensing no one's presence. As she exits the building, she feels something amiss, prompting her to stop suddenly. She touches her neck which is itching and discovers a faint red line, and moments later, more red lines appear around her and cause her body to be torn to shreds. Hoyle and the rest reach the exit but are met with the gruesome sight of their fallen comrade, Hyrie. Hoyle notices wires covered in her blood and ponders the origin of these wires scattered around the city. Urgently, he commands his team to sever all the wires and escape. He advises them to infuse their weapons with mana to effectively cut through the wires. Amid this, he contemplates the identity of the enemy, believing there's only one foe who could have been observing them for so long. As they continue cutting through the wires, they sense a presence watching them, resembling a screen akin to Iron Man's display. A spider-like machine was seen climbing on the side of a building and sending out blue tentacles toward the guild members. He looks up and spots it inches away from him multiple explosions caused by tentacles are then seen where the guild members are, their screams and shouts of pain are heard loudly in the air, and blood is splattered on the ground as screams are still heard. Hoyle is gasping for air after the aftermath of the blast he looks around the entire and sees the dead bodies of his guild members, and his arm has been torn apart. He screams out for the entity responsible to reveal itself. Amidst the wreckage, a machine materializes before him. He's taken aback and ponders if this is Jag Spinner. As he stares at the machine, memories flash through his mind, a female scientist handing a piece of machinery to the entity and reassuring it that it could continue fighting with this component even without ammunition. The machine in front of him retrieves the same part, evoking Hoyle's recollections. He screams at the machine and accuses it of being the monstrous bastard that killed his comrades. In response, the machine deploys its blue tentacles, swings a laser toward Hoyle, and tears him into pieces. As it does so, it utters, Protect the city. Subsequently, updates regarding Chongju Gate reveal a grim reality. Its first raid team made up of 58 KKP hunters had no survivors so did the second and third, and soon the gate boss Jagged Spinner Clear difficulty is promoted to red. The Chongju Gate raid is now on indefinite pause. The scene transitions, a heavy hammer lands on the ground as a man with braided hair discusses the weather and tells its similarity to what he saw on video. The woman with him advises against entering the city due to the high likelihood of encountering Jagged Spinner deeper into the gate. A group of people dressed alike emerges, led by an individual with white hair. The leader reminds them of the agreed-upon plan. The cloaks will secure the jewel of wisdom, while the remaining rewards, including the 60 billion, will be shared among their guild. The two guilds are facing off. They represent the latest entrance in the Chongju Sports Complex gate. The man with braided hair and the lady are members of one of Korea's top ten guilds, known as the Golden Lion. Their guild master, Huang Gumchol, holds an S rank, 
and the vice guild master, Huang Yona, holds an A rank. Accompanying them are 47 guild members. On the opposing side stands the white-haired man from the Magic Tower, known as Guild Taesung who is close to S rank, leading 48 mercenaries. In the other scene, among the Korean Hunter Association members is Han Hari, an A-ranked individual. She pours tea into a cup and offers it to Leon, addressing him as, Your Majesty. Leon tries the tea, comments that it's decent, and inquires about its name. Hari, standing behind him with a dejected expression, mentions it simply, barely tea, to befit his majesty. Leon sits atop a piece of cloth on rubble and enjoys the tea, while a notification appears that another individual has joined the team. The fourth ray team operation at Chongju Sports Complex Gate begins. Within the ruins of a deserted city, the fourth ray team of Chongju Gate has established their base camp. Members from various guilds are seen bustling around, surrounded by crates. Leon, still sipping on his tea, inquires about the apparent tension among them. Hari hesitates initially but ultimately decides to confide in the night. She expresses her concern about the smooth execution of their plans and the anxiety she feels if things don't progress as intended. Pausing for a moment, she reveals her genuine thoughts to Leon. She admits that the ideal outcome is for everything to proceed so well that he won't need to step in, yet she worries that such a scenario might deny him the opportunity to gain recognition and fame. Leon surprises her by agreeing with her assessment of him not intervening in the raiding party and leaves her taken aback. She's also surprised by Leon's agreement. He explains that if the King of Lionheart doesn't need to step in personally, it means the situation isn't dire. Capitalizing on the moment, Leon asks Hari about her view on the duties of a king in his kingdom. She takes a moment to grasp the question before responding, stating that, as she understands it, a king's duty is to rule. He tells her that is a given, but anyone can take on the role of ruling unless the person has hubris. He believes most rulers are quite similar. This prompts Hari to ponder about the king of knights. Reflecting on past events, she realizes something. Whenever Leon intervened, it was only when the attack couldn't be blocked. He clarifies that the king of Lionheart must act as the final defense. He elaborates, emphasizing that the king's intervention signifies significant shame for the knights and highlights the severity of the situation. She is taken aback by the explanation, just as Leon mentions that it seems like a coincidence this time. He expresses sadness, lamenting how he misses his honorable knights as it appears he might intervene once more in place of the raid party's weak members. She remains confused about Leon's statement. She reassures him that there is no necessity for his intervention this time, highlighting that the raid team includes S-rank hunter Huang Gong Chol and a skilled mage. Leon asks her if she calls them hunters. He admits that they're quite strong for ordinary humans. However, he has an issue with these so-called hunters as they lack experience in warfare, conveying his concern with a serious tone and expression. Jagged Spinner is seen conducting recon work as Leon inquires if they realize the outskirts of the city are actually safe, despite their confidence based on encountering the enemy only three times. Jagged Spinner is now near a raid team member, who remains unaware of its presence. Leon continues lecturing about how the hunters label themselves a raid team and asks them to analyze monster patterns, and react accordingly. He finds it to be comical, prompting Hari to become more restless upon hearing his words. Leon explains that a true general responds to the situation without relying on fixed patterns, just as Jag Spinner seems poised for action. However, before he can share what he knows about it, its eyes start glowing intensely red, emanating a menacing aura. Explosions erupt across the base camp, causing the raid members to cry out in agony and bewilderment, questioning what's happening. Leon intended to describe Jag Spinner as a skilled warlord. A voice is heard calling out Yappy, the Jag Spinner's real name. It issues an apology, expressing regret. The female scientist, emanating a maternal aura, assures that this is her final moment, visibly injured and bleeding. Before she departs, she requests one last favor from him. Entity number 10253, Jag Spinner's final order, was to eliminate all unidentified beings invading the city. A gun barrel emerges from Yappy's shoulder as he unleashes a barrage of bullets, raining down upon the unsuspecting raid members in the base camp. The air fills with screams and shouts as the bullets find their targets. The raid members quickly realize that the assaults originate from Yappi. They caution each other to seek cover while the relentless attacks persist. A clicking sound resonates as Yappi exposes additional glowing red eyes across its body. It had switched to a heat-like motion sensor, 
enabling it to detect the raid members' collective gathering within the city. Observing the multiple groups gathered, Yapi charges its railgun, releasing massive amounts of electricity. A powerful blast erupts from its railgun, targeting the raid members who had gathered for safety. A blue explosion illuminates the area as the raid members desperately attempt to evade Yapi's explosive assaults. The railgun's attack generates a colossal blue electric explosion at the heart of the base camp, shrouding the area in dust and smoke. The raid members can only curse and stare in horror at Yappy's devastating future tech powers. They witness the unfortunate fate of their comrades who couldn't find cover from the monster's attacks. They wonder what kind of monstrous force their foe possesses to cause such rapid and widespread destruction. A system notification appears for Yappy, indicating a 23% loss in the life response of the unidentified being and it prepares to initiate a continuous barrage. It continues to charge its energy which is now at 48%. However, before it can reach full charge, Gumchol appears in the air beside it, wielding his raised hammer. He moves swiftly to strike Yapi, commanding it to perish. With a single mighty swing of his massive hammer, it unleashes a powerful attack, sending shockwaves through the air upon landing on their foe. Witnessing parts of itself being destroyed momentarily confuses Yapi as its system warns of damage to its main joint region, escalating internal pressure and altering its priorities. The gun barrel materializes directly in front of Gamchal as Yappy's system commands it to eliminate the unidentified being. However, he wears a confident smile, informing Yappy that it's too late while calling out for Gemson. With a radiant aura enveloping her, she appears, flames shrouding her arms as she emerges behind Yappy. Delivering a devastating blow, she sends it tumbling from the building to the ground, angrily asserting not to address her as Gemson. As Yappy struggles to recover from the onslaught, a voice calls out, commending their efforts. The raiding party's mage appears amidst lightning striking from above. He reassures Gamchal and Gamson that he will take charge, weaving magic between his hands. Yappy's system notifies of an activity overload, triggering an emergency purge. With its radar system down, the system permits it to utilize restricted resources while scanning the three raid members before it. It is instructed by the system to activate the RWR equipment within the city. Cameras throughout the ravaged city become operational as the system commands Yappy to change the target. Scanning the mage, who registers a risk level of 3 with a prioritized removal status, Yappy is observed darting between buildings, attempting a swift escape. The raid members are taken aback by its retreat and opt to pursue it. As Yappy bounds through the air, it once more exposes a gun barrel aimed at the raid members. Unleashing another wave of bullets, the raid members find themselves helpless against the onslaught. The mage issues a directive for everyone to assemble, preparing to activate the distortion force field. The mage, named Taysom, retrieves a small marble-like object from within his coat. Dropping it to the ground, he applies pressure, resulting in a yellow barrier expanding into a vast circle around the base camp. A bullet approaches the barrier but deflects upon impact. A raid member queries the mage about the barrier, noting the altered trajectory of the bullets. He explains that it's a magical tool designed specifically to combat Jag Spinner, though he feels ashamed of the necessity of using it so early. Upon encountering the barrier, the enemy's internal system recalls the risk factor and observes the abnormal phenomenon. It initiates a maintenance operation and, after a while, completes its analysis of the barrier. The system quickly scans the location of the raid team and the barrier they use. It spots three weak points on the barrier namely D15, S37, and F11. It initiates a fire command. A bullet swiftly hits a raid member beside Taesung, shocking him as he stares at what just happened. He ponders the impossibility, as he already calculated the angles at which the bullets would swerve. He contemplates what that thing could be as another wave of bullets is unleashed at the raid team. Explosions occur within the barrier, as the bullets effortlessly curve into its blind spots. A raid member urgently shouts at Taesung to promptly deactivate the distortion force field, expressing how it hinders the team's ability to predict the bullet's trajectory. As the tension simmers, Taesung, still seething with anger, reluctantly agrees to power down momentarily. He issues orders to the raid team, urging them to charge toward Jag Spinner once the force field is disabled. The team, resolute in their determination, readies themselves to sprint forward as the mage begins the countdown to the force field's deactivation. However, just before the critical moment, a frantic shout pierces the air, causing the entire team to halt in their tracks. Both Taesung and Gemson are jolted by this sudden interruption. 
glittering lines materialize, tracing intricate patterns around the raid team, revealing a network of wires. The expressions on both of their faces instantly shift to horror and shock as they comprehend the perilous situation. They are encircled by wires, a revelation that sends chills down their spines. The team comes to the stark realization that Jag Spinner isn't just making a getaway. They find themselves trapped in a trap. Puzzled, they question how it managed to set up the intricate network of wires so swiftly, seemingly materializing above them. Once again, the ominous reappearance of Jag Spinner's railgun adds to the tension, as it charges while positioned on the wires surrounding the raid team. Taesung with disbelieving eyes struggles to comprehend the unfolding events. He reflects on their hasty assembly within the force field as a mistake. He realizes that it leaves them vulnerable, unable to evade the opponent's impending railgun attack. As the system signals its complete charge and prepares to issue the fire command, a sudden anomaly grabs its attention, a horse galloping through the desert. The raid team, including Damchol, Gamsun, and others, reacts with disbelief at this unexpected sight, an actual horse racing toward the wires. Their alarm spikes as they witness the horse's eyes glowing, nibbling through the wires with an almost otherworldly determination. Leon steps forward, laying a hand on the horse, a wave of nostalgia washing over him as he greets an old friend with a fond smile. With an air of regality he mounts it, a sight that leaves Gemson utterly astounded. Perched proudly on the horse, he appears before the astonished team, seizing their focus and leaving them in silent awe. Attention, warriors! Leon's voice resounded, commanding the group's focus. The bravery to charge into the midst of adversaries, alone with nothing but a horse, I the king of the lion heart, commend thee for such valor. Even their foe's sophisticated system is thrown into confusion by his unexpected actions and words. He proclaims himself blessed by the honor of Jag Spinner's presence, and extends the esteemed offer of a duel. He graciously grants it the royal permission to engage in combat with him. Warrior, his voice thunders, imposing a reverent hush upon the surroundings. Gomchal is visibly tense with a mixture of disbelief and awe, while Taesang appears resigned. Those nearby are left pondering and confused, questioning the significance and intent behind his words and considering the notion that he may be acting irrationally. The team members, still reeling from shock and horror, are unable to comprehend Leon's audacious offer to Jag Spinner for a duel. Yet, it remains stoic and unwavering in concentration. It fine-tuned railgun acceleration and monitored the generator's capacity which is now at 13%. In the system's assessment, Leon is deemed a level zero threat, classified merely as an unidentified entity, an organism that needs to be eliminated, as it perceives him as a straightforward being. Leon states, Join me, my loyal old companion, and summons his sword through his innate abilities. His horse responds with a fierce neigh, pounding the ground emphatically. The system commands Jag Spinner to fire the railgun at Leon, who dismisses it, declaring, A true knight remains impervious to cowardly long-range weapons. His eyes shine brightly as a golden aura envelopes his form. Rushing directly toward the oncoming railgun projectile without making any attempt to evade, Leon's charge creates a path of devastation in its path. Closing in on the impending danger, he meets it head-on. With unwavering resolve, he lowers his stance and elevates his spear in a determined posture. The clash of these formidable forces results in a colossal explosion, sending shockwaves rippling through the entire city. In the aftermath, Shattered remnants of machinery hurtle through the air and scatter in all directions. Jagged Spinner witnesses the unimaginable scene of a breach in its railgun attack as Leon not only closes the distance but also delivers a mighty blow with his lance. In that fleeting instance, Jagged Spinner's highly sophisticated AI calculations abruptly cease to function. Struggling to make sense of this unexpected occurrence, the AI system falters as Leon casually comments on its resilience. Designed to analyze situations, the system acknowledges the limitations of Leon's sword, an old-fashioned jousting weapon. Despite its speed, its impact potential is confined by its mass, creating a puzzle for the AI's logical processing of the situation. Consequently, the system designates Leon as a level zero threat considers him unworthy of further action, and remains confident that the railgun can instantly eliminate him. The assessment relied entirely on the machine's calculated evaluation. However, Merely three seconds before the anticipated impact, Leon's resounding shout triggered an extraordinary occurrence. A thin barrier formed, exhibiting a pattern unlike any previously recorded abnormal phenomena. As the collision loomed two seconds away, there was a direct clash with the railgun's bullet. 
According to the projected scope, the anticipated outcome should have eradicated the opponent, even if they attempted to block it. Yet, a mere second before the impact, the railgun's bullet was effortlessly sent soaring into the air, defying all expectations in a seemingly playful manner. Effortlessly, Leon diverts the bullet, triggering an explosion in its trail. Contrary to the system's observation, there is no direct clash or visible attempt to block. Instead, the bullet is seamlessly deflected. This maneuver seems ingrained in the Knight Templar's instincts, executed with a natural ease, hinting at a miraculous ability possessed by humanity's most formidable fighters, a skill that upholds the world's laws, known as the Divine Law, specifically manifesting as the blessing of the arrow shield. This extraordinary skill enables the deflection of any long-range attack once, regardless of its nature. Regarding its capability to deflect an atomic bomb, that's an entirely different league altogether. After Leon's forceful strike sends Jag's spinner hurtling into a building, his focus stays fixed on the impact site. Electricity crackles around, signifying the system's ongoing struggle to comprehend and analyze this unprecedented event. Eventually, the system feels compelled to elevate Leon's threat level to threat level 5, as it witnesses the noble golden aura radiating from his body. The AI system commands Jag's spinner to retreat from the battlefield, triggering a hidden hatch to emerge from its body. Smoke billows, veiling its form as it withdraws. Meanwhile, Leon gazes toward the spot where he had sent his foe flying, wearing a slightly perturbed expression as he comments on its retreat. In a flashback, a female scientist instructs Yap B to guard a specific location housing a purple orb, emitting a dark aura. She emphasizes the importance of preventing anyone from approaching it. Soon after, a mechanical arm is discarded onto the ground. The system notifies Yap P that the heavy arms are currently non-functional. It further details the temporary waste disposal, consisting of five regular bullets and 36 special bullets. Additionally, it communicates the availability of a sidearm, a 60mm heavy machine gun, with 657 rounds remaining, underscoring the importance of crafting handmade ammunition. The AI alerts it about damage to the resupply wire cutter and support joint check, causing significant imbalance. Given the level 5 threat, the system opts for a new weapon model from enemies and initiates modulation on Yap-P, leading to increased electric currents on the platform. Another memory surfaces, showing the female scientist expressing gratitude to Yap-P for safeguarding her city. The flashback concludes as the AI system announces the completion of strategic modulation and signifies Yap-P's readiness to resume the mission. In Block B, at the city's core, a team of raid members navigates through an alleyway amidst the towering buildings. The lead member pauses, signaling to the others that 250 meters ahead, a segment of a machine gun peeks from the corner of a building across the street, an indication of Jag Spinner's presence in that location. He directs the long-range members to cautiously proceed across the street, while keeping the rest of the team in reserve for a potential distraction. However, Jag Spinner's sudden splatter of blood across his face captures his attention, alerting them to a grim and unsettling sight. His team is gruesomely scattered into fragments by the wires in the air, their bodies sprawled in a pool of blood. This brutal sight begins to unsettle him, urging him to pivot and confront whatever might lurk behind him. With his sword drawn, he lashes out at what he believes to be Jag Spinner, expressing shock and disdain at the scenario. Yet, to his astonishment, there's nothing behind him, only a red line materializing on his face. While Jag Spinner senses an unsettling presence, a faint indication that something might be missing. Suddenly, more wires start to spread around him, accompanied by red lines spreading across his body. The raid member finds himself sliced into pieces by these wires, and Jag Spinner emerges from the shadows, surveying the havoc caused by the controlled wires. Meanwhile, the AI system alerts it about the completion of eliminating five unidentified beings. Yet Yap notices a screen displaying that one raid team member is still alive and attempting to flee while expressing his fear of death. The system swiftly pinpoints his location. The raid member, identified as a threat level zero, pleads desperately for mercy as he collapses among tombstones. The foe looms over him, instilling fear, but before it can make a move, a memory flashes through its mind. The recollection involves a conversation with the female scientist concerning the city's burial grounds. She expresses a wish to be laid to rest there and become an everlasting part of the city. In that poignant moment, she asks if Yap would continue to protect the city, even in such times. The flashback concludes with the system updating its logical reasoning, firstly, the complete removal of the invaders, and secondly, the same assessment reiterated. 
has static electricity envelopes its legs. Further AI updates follow, mentioning modifications in autonomous evaluation, hacking logical reasoning, and decision-making. His sudden shift plunges the man into a state of silent confusion, tears streaming down his face. Unexpectedly, Jagged Spinner starts to retreat from the guy, surprising him with its allowance for his departure, bouncing away as it does so. Taesum calls out to the man, checking on his well-being. Surprisingly, he feels that Jag Spinner spared him out of exhaustion instead of intending harm. He speculates that perhaps the machine detected his approach and chose to retreat, recognizing its inability to triumph. Taesung agrees, acknowledging the limitations even machines can possess. Surveying the cemetery, they observe it's notably cleaner compared to the rest of the city. Meanwhile, Jag Spinner continues its movement across the city, with its AI system assessing the enemy's strength. Despite a high probability of the enemy prevailing, it strategically chooses to retreat, making a calculated decision based on the circumstances. Taesung and the other raid members depart from the cemetery, finding it unpleasant. Meanwhile, at Jag Spinner's location, the system prioritizes protecting the citizens, even in death. It estimates 49 remaining enemies, noting that Leon, a level 5 threat, remains healthy. The level 3 threat also appears in good health while the success rate of removing level 1 threats stands at 35.7%. As the system prepares to resume the battle, a shadow catches Yappy's attention. It turns to investigate, and Leon's familiar face emerges from the light behind the doors. He asks the opponent if it has enjoyed its time with the commoners. We see Leon standing proudly before the emblem of a magnificent golden lion. He embraced chivalry. Describing him as the embodiment of chivalry wouldn't be an overstatement. He detests cowardly ambushes more than anything else and strives for a fair fight. He asks Yappy with a stern expression if it's prepared for the battle. It is left bewildered upon hearing this. Leon embodies the spirit of fighting fair battles. However, it's important to note that his opponent may not adhere to the same code. Yet that doesn't deter him from his knightly morals. He doesn't allow anything to break his resolve. That's his strength. That's what makes him the chosen one. Leon wields his sword striding confidently through the flames, his passion evident in his eyes as he proudly swings his weapon. Drawing near Yapi, he growls that he should not expect honor from a machine. As Yapi activates its red light to analyze Leon's state, preparing for the fight, it checks its equipment, a heavy machine gun with 480 bullets remaining and four wire cutters. Adjusting its aim, Yapi fires on Leon as he stands steadfast amidst the fire. Yet, the fireball fails to even touch him thwarted by his divine blessing of the arrow shield. Through the burning flames, Leon emits a godly aura, detected by Yappy as an abnormal phenomenon. It then commands an analysis of the curvature in a 360-degree span. As it fiercely maneuvers around Leon, it launches fireballs from points F12, N23, and Q31, attacking him from three sides with fiery blasts. Despite the onslaught of fireballs, Leon remains unmoved, maintaining his posture without a hint of movement. His eyes shine brightly, and a mysterious smile graces his lips. Even as the ground beneath him wrecks and cracks, his commitment remains unshaken. The area around him is utterly demolished, with even Yappy affected by the flying debris from the explosive chaos. Suddenly, Leon smashes his sword onto the ground, causing further wreckage. This action catches the machine by surprise. Yappy fiercely moves, Launching fireballs at Leon from every direction, its demeanor now filled with fury. Suddenly, Leon emerges from the burning flames and flying wreckage, amid smoke and ash. Riding his majestic horse, he wields his sword in one hand and reins in the other. Leon, glaring at Yappy with an intense gaze, addresses his horse, noting that the enemy wants to play hide and seek with them. After witnessing Leon emerge and scathe from numerous attacks, the situation becomes incomprehensible to Yappy. It moves fiercely, launching attacks in multiple directions in an attempt to capture him. The onslaught causes fireballs to crash into rocks and send wrecks flying through the air, leaving behind widespread destruction. Unperturbed by the relentless attacks, Leon continues riding his horse, skillfully evading each assault. Despite Yappy's violent barrage of fireballs aimed at immobilizing him and his stallion, he remains unharmed and maintains his swift pace. Yappy is astounded by Leon's unwavering resolve and wonders how an organism can exhibit such remarkable speed. However, it remains an enigma for Yappy, further puzzling the eye system. 
While moving fiercely, it suddenly smashes into a pole standing right in the middle. However, it manages to evade the obstacle, quickly recovering and preparing for a massive attack. Simultaneously, Leon is riding his stallion with intensity. He shouts and addresses it, guiding it as they rush toward Yapi, eventually coming to a stop at a distance. He murmurs words of praise, acknowledging the situation as not bad. Yap Pi, however, struggles to comprehend the turn of events with an empty head. Suddenly, it adjusts its aim and moves furiously to launch multiple fireballs toward the horse. This time, Yap Pi also fires bullets along with the fireballs. Leon actively dodges the attacks and skillfully avoids the onslaught. Meanwhile, Yap Pi is in the air, its aim locked onto its foe. While Leon is steadfastly dodging all the attacks, broken pieces of rocks and wrecks are flying everywhere. The atmosphere is dark amidst the smoke caused by the fireballs and their destruction. Leon's eyes are emitting golden light and with grim expressions, he addresses his horse. Moving through the broken rocks, the stallion surpasses Yapi and flies above it in the air. While Yapi's remaining ammunition is only 68. He gives a command to fire all of his ammo on Leon. All of the bullets and fireballs are fired at the same moment, moving in the air toward their target. He is wielding its sword while riding his stallion, and some of the fires directly hit him. With anger blazing in his eyes, emitting golden rays, Leon surprises Yapi by remaining relatively unfazed by the relentless attacks. Filled with fury, he angrily shouts, Glory to the Lion Hearts. It appears as though he's enveloped in a shower of golden light. With a swift motion, he moves his gleaming golden sword through the air, marking the end of Yapi's tail. As the sword arcs, it emits a sharp golden light slicing through the air directly towards Yatpi. Upon contact, the sword cuts through the machine, cleaving it in two. Both severed parts hover in the air, emanating sharp white rays. Yatpi's system detects lethal damage incurred from the fierce sword attack, signaling that its operational limit has been surpassed. The commander, observing the unfolding events while seated before the wisdom ball, grimly utters, What is sealed here shall never be released. Amidst this, a half-broken piece of Yap Pi unexpectedly emits a sharp red light, signaling its activation for self-detonation. The self-detonation process ignites the surroundings, setting off all explosives intended for landfill facilities within Yapi's parts. Suddenly, all of its fragments begin to glow intensely. Leon, taken aback by the unfolding spectacle, watches in shock as a colossal explosion erupts from the ground, soaring to massive heights in the air resembling atomic fission. When JS-1053 opens its eyes, it finds itself inside a storage container with the scent of oil lingering in the air. The commander issues a directive for it to go and protect the city and emphasizes its duty to safeguard the city. Without hesitation, Jag Spinner rushes in the designated direction to fulfill its mission. A colossal figure moves with determination. Yapi has only one goal in mind, to support its allies and protect the city. With a singular focus on the protection of the city, Thousands of Jag spinners converge on the city, taking on and defeating the enemy forces. They emerge as the city's guardians and become heroes in the process. This story of unmanned tanks, led by JS 1053, saving the city from a seemingly hopeless state, becomes a heartening tale for the citizens who were losing faith. It's a story of resilience and triumph which instills hope and pride in the hearts of the people. The Jag spinners evolved into a symbol of hope becoming the stalwart defenders against colossal monsters threatening the city. Number 10,253 and its fellow machines were remodeled, continuing to protect under the commander's guidance. They tirelessly defended the city until it lay in ruins, consumed by flames. As the city succumbed to destruction, the commander's final plea to Yap Pi, the remaining battle machine, echoed through the chaos. The commander implored Yap Pi to safeguard the city's remnants, emphasizing the importance of never giving up on that vital mission. This became the last directive for the remaining machines, ensuring that no one could approach the treasured jewel of Wisdom Ball. Prepared and determined, the Jag spinners fortified themselves, standing as the city's last line of defense against any malevolent forces seeking to steal the invaluable jewel of wisdom. It shielded and persevered with unwavering resolve, faithfully carrying out its duty until this very moment when it lies severed and helpless on the ground amid the chaotic explosion, Leon falls into a crack feeling unscathed as he falls without any harm. He ponders that he is saved by the effective blessing of the arrow shield. He surveys the surroundings, spotting a massive purple orb, speculating it might be the object the jag spinner fiercely protected, the jewel of wisdom. The jewel is right in front of him. Charging his sword, he advances toward it, 
firm in his belief that it shouldn't exist. Suddenly, sensing something from Yap P, he turns and asks if it is still attempting to fight. He inquires how long it has safeguarded this place and fought alone. Leon expresses admiration for its unwavering dedication and loyalty, acknowledging Yapi as a knight of utmost devotion. He asserts that all living beings across dimensions owe their gratitude for its selfless service. Addressing it with reverence, Leon refers to it as Sir Jagd. Solemnly, he declares that its quest is fulfilled. Raising his sword toward the sky, a golden light emanates from the blade, extending from the ground to the heavens. As a result, the jewel of wisdom is destroyed and shattered into pieces. Leon bids Yapi to rest in peace and offers heartfelt gratitude for its invaluable service.